Welcome everybody. So good morning, counselors. Um, this is the council retreat um, that we're having this morning. So our first item on the agenda will be a finance 101 presentation. Um, the primary person will be Mark Gassaway from the auditor's office, the finance director. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity before they get started and Emily can um, chime in maybe at the end um, of the role of the finance team and then have them introduce themselves as well. So uh, Mark, again, Mark Gasway, finance director, um, and Sarah Lowe, chief deputy treasurer, and Emily Svetzig. For the role of the finance team, they really do look at the county's budget, um, ongoing finances, and also future um, planning as well as our actuals. We meet weekly usually, that I meet with them weekly, and so they have different areas of expertise that they're coming forward to the table to provide consultation to me either during, during the budget process or throughout the year. Um, so I'm gonna let them, um, again, introduce themselves and maybe provide a little bit more additional information on what they do. So Mark Gathaway, do you wanna get started? Thank you, Kathleen, and, and good morning, uh, counselors. Um, I'm pleased to be able to come and, and chat with you a little bit this morning. Um, Clark County Finance 101 is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I know that some of you have heard some of these things before, but hopefully there's some new information and, and you know, it never hurts to review, right? So um, we'll, we'll move into this. Um, if you could move to the next slide. As Kathleen uh, mentioned, uh, in Clark County, we have what's what we refer to as the county finance team, and it consists of the county finance director, the chief deputy treasurer, and the budget director. Uh, we do meet with um, the county manager uh, weekly, and we have a lot to talk about. Usually, we we end up talking much longer than the hour we have allotted. Uh, we do bring in other staff members as as needed. Uh, and so there's a lot of expertise in the county that we uh, rely on. Uh, I, I thought I'd introduce myself um, uh, and then I'll let uh, Sarah introduce herself. And then uh, if Emily's on, we'll have her introduce herself as the budget director. So um, I'm the, the county finance director. I work in financial services under the direction of the county auditor. And as finance director, we're responsible for uh, the accounting and financial reporting for the entire county, as well as establishing internal controls. And we also uh, manage the audit function for the county. And so there's uh, various things that are that happen under the, the county auditor, but this is the, the role of, fi of the finance director. And so um, Sarah, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, counselors. My name is Sarah Lowe, and I'm the Chief Deputy Treasurer for Clark County. I've been in the role a little over five years. Um, in my role, I'm responsible for overseeing the billing, collection, and disbursement of all property-related taxes, uh, and that goes for the county as well as our 40-plus taxing districts. I'm also responsible for overseeing the cash management debt um, and investment pool. Right now, Clark County has an investment pool that it manages that's about $1.1 billion. Uh, that amount does fluctuate on the amount of bond proceeds that we're managing, mostly for school districts. Um, one thing I always just like to emphasize, and I, I have already recently said this, but um, it's just that our services are provided not just to Clark County, uh, but to all of the other junior taxing districts, of which there are about 40. Mark's going to get to this a little bit later in the presentation, um, but many of the funds that the county manages are called agency funds, and those are actually funds uh, that are held for the districts, and we use those funds to disperse and collect their property taxes. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. And of course, Emily Switzig is the budget director, and I don't see her on. Emily, are you on? No, she's not on yet. She's okay. had to reboot. Okay. So, um, I'll, just real briefly, I'll I'll uh, let her introduce herself. But the the budget director is responsible for uh, facilitating, preparing, and monitoring the budget. There's a lot of process that we have to go through. We have a lot of 
uh, RCW regulations that we have to follow in the budget process. Uh, as the um, returning counselors know, it's a, a year long process really to uh, uh, create and then go through the approval process for the budget. And uh, you'll um, hear a little bit more about that uh, probably in another presentation from Emily. So if I could go to the next slide, please. And I can share also, Council, that Emily and the Budget Office did prepare some documentation just for your information. It will not be presented today, but it is on our website um, that talks about, about the Budget Office, the Fund Balance Policy Guide Improvement Story Worksheet, um, and Fund Management Best Practices. So that information is out for the Council's information as well. Great. Thank you. So just an overview. In the county, we have approximately 490 funds that we have to track. And it sounds like a lot, and it is. Uh, a lot of those funds are um, very active. We're looking at these things almost on a daily basis. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, and I'm going to let her talk about this a little bit, 370 of those funds are either managed by the treasurer's office or we use those in the auditor's office to manage transaction processes. So we have clearing accounts, we have uh, a lot of different um, funds that we use to process the data. So um, let me uh, turn a little bit more time back to Sarah and she's gonna talk about those agency funds for a few minutes. Well, I think you did kind of cover it, Mark. And um, those funds are held uh, for or created for the districts. And essentially, uh, when we create uh, collect property taxes, we use those funds to disperse, disperse the property taxes to them. We also provide them other cash management services uh, like processing their payroll and AP. Um, the majority of these funds really um, are just held as their operating funds. And then there are some also that are held uh, for their bond proceeds as well as making their debt payments. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? So that leaves about 120 funds that we actively manage. And, and you may be asking yourself, well, why do we need 120 funds to manage these? And a lot of the, the funds, the different funds are driven by RCW. We are required by law to track certain revenues in independent funds. And I've kind of given you a breakdown here of how those 120 funds are grouped. Uh, we have about 15 internal service funds. Those internal service funds receive uh, monies from the general fund, from the road fund, from where the participation comes from. And then we use those for specific services. Um, and examples of those are like our general liability insurance. Uh, each of the funds that have operations in them pay into the uh, general liability fund, and then uh, we pay the bills out of that single fund. So it's a shared responsibility. It's not just burden on the general fund itself. Uh, again, others examples of those would be our healthcare uh, self-insurance fund, our, our workers comp fund. We also have a facilities fund that manages facilities countywide, and all of those um, operations pay into that fund, and then we uh, expend uh, out of those funds for those specific purposes. We also have enterprise funds. Uh, enterprise funds, you can equate to a business-like operation. And the examples of those would be uh, our clean water, solid waste, and tri-mountain. So the revenues and expenses that come in and out of those funds are operated more like a business. And the accounting treatment is different for enterprise funds because they actually have their own balance sheet. So um, it's more of a business or enterprise type of a, a operation. We also have capital funds. Now, um, we have a lot of capital funds because we have um, different districts. The county is divided up into districts. So for example, our impact fees are received by district. And the intent of that is so that the expenditures are made to correspond with those districts. So um, I, uh, the, the laws that um, 
allow us to collect those fees, say that they have to be spent for particular benefit within that area. Um, in addition to the impact fee fees, we receive REIT, uh, real estate excise tax, and we also have um, a capital fund for our technology projects so that once a project is approved, we put the money into a technology fund to uh, expend for that particular project. We also, uh, going down the list, we have uh, in our community services department, we have 15 funds. And again, a lot of those are because there's specific revenues involved with each of their programs that we are not allowed to commingle. So they have, uh, for a single department, they have the most individual funds. Then we have 34 governmental funds. Now, in government, you know, often they talk about, well, you get all this revenue. The, the um, I guess the explanation of why we have to have these different funds is because many, much of that revenue has to be tracked separately because it is restricted for specific purposes. Uh, and a good example of that is road fund. We collect property taxes from the citizens that can only be used for specific purposes. So that's deposited into the road fund. And again, I've listed some examples of uh, what restricted uh, funds would look like. Uh, another good example is our uh, Metropolitan Park District. We can only use the funds collected in that um, uh, for Metropolitan Park District for the operation and maintenance of those parks. It cannot be spent for you know, uh, other purposes. So we're gonna, we're gonna move on here to the next slide. So that leaves one fund unaccounted for, and that is the general fund. And we spend a lot of time talking about the general fund because it is the most flexible spending uh, source that we have at the county. And it also covers some of the largest uh, expenditures that we have. All of the um, operations that we do within the county, uh, the general operations come out of the general fund. And I'm gonna um, break that down of what actually comes out of the general fund. So if we could go to the next slide. First of all, I wanted to give an example. Uh, 2019 is the uh, most recent year that we've closed. We're in the process right now of closing 2020. And I have a few updates that I'll I'll include as I go through, but I wanted to let council know, well, how much revenue did we actually get in the general fund in, in 2019? So if you go to the next slide. Okay, so we received in 2019 in the general fund, 167.5 million. And in the general fund, and I don't know if this is for good or for bad, but there are approximately 300 different revenue sources. So when we talk about general fund revenue, often we think, well, that's you know property tax and sales tax. But in actuality, there's uh, almost 300 different revenue sources that come into the general fund. This is a breakdown of the uh, percentage by percentage of those different revenue sources. So property tax basically is almost 41% of the general fund revenue. And as you can see, I've put some notes about the characteristics of these different revenues. For example, property tax, is it's stable, it's predictable, it's restricted to growth, to 1% growth plus new construction. So we have a very good um, ability of forecasting what that property tax will look like. Uh, sales tax is about just 25.6% uh, of our general fund revenue. Now, sales tax is can be much more volatile uh, we know that the seven-year uh, annual growth is almost 11%. However, we've seen in the last two years that it is, it's been decreasing. In 2019, it was 5.9% growth, but in 2020, it was down to 5.4% growth. So you can see that the growth of sales tax um, has, has been declining. A lot of that um, large growth came immediately following the recession after sales tax had dropped, uh, sales tax revenue had dropped dramatically. So it's a little bit skewed, but you can see that on in in the long term, sales tax growth averages just over three percent a year. 
usually close to about three and a half percent a year. Uh, yes, three and a half percent a year. So uh, we have other revenues, and this is a category that is is largely ignored. Um, you know, thirty three percent, over thirty three percent of our of our general fund revenue comes from other revenue. And you're thinking, well, what is that? Well, I've listed that out. It's it's fines, it's fees, it's grants, it's intergovernmental charges. We do work for other governments, uh, interdepartmental charges. So the general fund has the ability to charge, for example, road fund for services that it provides. Uh, that comes through our indirect cost allocation plan. Um, this revenue has been the most volatile over the last few years. You can see that um, its decline over the last seven years, 2.2%. In 2019, it declined 6.2%. And in 2020, it declined 6.4%. So you can see that those other revenues, which for a long period of time had sustained a lot of the operations that are paid for through the general fund are continuing to decline. And I know, if, if you're an accountant like me, you're doing the mental math here, are our increases keeping up with our decreases? Well, in 2019, we had an increase in revenues of about 5 million and a decrease in revenues of 4.2 million. So we actually increased only less than a million dollars, only about $800,000. And that $800,000 had to cover all of the cost increases that we have built in which I'm going to talk about later on when I talk about expenses. So, um, you know, it's almost like we're, we're our revenues in the general fund are are just I'll use the term like treading water. We're just keeping in place. And this bears out in 2020. When you see the report from 2020, you're going to see revenues uh, uh, non uh, coronavirus relief revenues. So I'm going to separate it out so that you can see what our true impact was. Uh, you're going to see actually a flat or almost a decline. And again, a lot of that is because of the economic circumstances, but um, we'll have that analysis done probably within with, within a couple of months. So if I could have the next slide, please. So I wanted to show uh, what it looks like over the, uh, a trend line over the last few years of our revenues based on these categories. And you can see at the bottom in the darkest um, bluish green color are other revenues. And you can see how that trend is, is declining slightly. Our property tax, again, very stable. They continue to grow um, moderately, moderately. Usually the um, average growth for property taxes is just over 2% a year. And then the top block is the sales tax. And you can see cut recovery uh, the recovery trend coming out of the, the Great Recession, um, where those property taxes are at now. The line at the top is charting our expenses. And you'll say, well, you know, we're pretty lucky. You know, our, our, our expense line is, you know, just below our revenue line. Well, that's not by, um, you know, that, that, that's not by chance. We know in the county, we have to balance our budget. We're required to have a balanced budget. So we're not able to um, work at a deficit. We have to have our expenses come in under our revenues. So it's it's not happenstance that the, the trend line for the expenses comes in below our revenues. So if I go to the next slide, please. So again, this is just kind of a recap. You know, all of the revenues other than the general fund are restricted and can only be spent on specific purposes. And that's why we're not able to say, well, we're gonna move, uh, you know, large amounts of dollars out of certain funds to support general fund activities. It's, it's not allowed, we're not able to do that. And as an auditor's office, we're required to monitor and audit those expenses so that the uh, expenses for each fund are appropriate. So if we determine that if an expenditure needs to be made out of a restricted fund uh, or it needs to be made out of the general fund, that's where it's that's where it's recorded. We can't take general fund expenses and put them into a restricted fund. So that's one of the things that we're required to do as as financial services in the auditor's office. Another thing that we do is every year the council approves the budget 
which is the legal spending authority for each of those funds. And the auditor's office is required to monitor to make sure that expenses don't exceed budget. So we are following um, the will of the council and making sure that uh, your um, authorization is followed. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So 2019 general fund revenue, where did it go? What did we buy with this revenue? And so here's where it gets down to what are we doing with the revenues that we receive? So if you go into the next slide. And I apologize, this slide is very busy. I, I trying to provide as much information as I can as succinctly, but I wanted to make sure that um, you had the information. So this is a slide you'll probably want to get a copy of, or it, you probably already do. So in the general fund, the largest direct cost that we have is law and justice. 66.7% of all of general fund expenditures is going to law and justice. And the bullet points there um, point out specifically what the dollar amounts that are going into there. For example, um, you may not think of this, but I, I, and maybe you do, I don't know. Um, you know, indigent defense, that's part of our law and justice program. We spend $6 million out of the general fund for indigent defense uh, in 2019. Uh, and again, here's examples of what's been out of there. Uh, the next category, citizen services, accounts for almost 8% of the general fund. And that includes medical examiner, our GIS department, your department, the counselors, uh, what you spend out of there directly, uh, animal control, fire marshal, things like that. So those are citizen services that are paid for out of the general fund. Then the general fund is also a big supporter of other programs and activities outside of the general fund. Uh, we transfer 10%, just over 10% of the general fund revenue. So that's about $16 million a year to other funds. And these are the largest um, uh, funds that we transfer into. For example, facilities, we pay debt, we uh, support public health, we have our, our equipment replacement program. All of that is done out of these transfers. Uh, internal services account for 8.4% of the general fund. And again, I talked about the, some of those internal service funds earlier, but we also have internal services that are solely housed within the general fund. And those include the human resource department, technology services, um, our IT department, which is, um, you know, it's a big expense, but it's essential in this environment that we work in. Uh, without the IT um, department, we would not be able to do this meeting that we're having today. It's, it would be very difficult. So these are all things that we provide countywide within the general fund. Then there's a smaller group of other electeds. Uh, th there's three offices, the assessor's office, the auditor's office, and the treasurer's office. Those are all accounted for within the general fund. And I wanted to point out that some of these services for example, the internal services, we're able to allocate that out to those restricted funds that I talked about, and we recover those costs. The, the restricted funds like the road fund, is required; they're required to pay for the services that are provided to them. With the assessor's office and the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, auditor's office and the treasurer's office, certain amount of those funds are also charged out. So financial services supports the entire county so we're able to build those out through our cost allocation plan. About 60% um, of the auditor's office and about 30% of the treasurer's office are recovered through that plan. So, so this is where the money's going. This is where the general fund money goes. And then what, what are we paying for within those departments? So if you could go to the next slide, please. Well, so what did it buy? What are we buying with, with this money? Um, next slide, please. So this is what the county spends its money on. And um, no surprise, as a service provider to the community, the largest expense that we have in the county is our salaries and our benefits. We basically are, are a employer of people that is providing services to the community. Um, <clears throat> within the general fund, as you know, we have you know the sheriff's office you know, over 300 employees. We have um, a, uh, a lot of those direct services to the citizens. Um, some of the other categories you see are supplies categories, actually very small. 
In those transfers that we talked about to other departments, about 10%, um, we're supporting more services um, that are provided to citizens, things like the Department of Health, things like uh, our parks, all of those are in that transfer category. And then in the services category, uh, we uh, contract for services, we have contract you know, maintenance for our uh, software, a lot of that is being paid through that services category. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. So I wanted to break out um, salaries and benefits being our single uh, largest cost in the county. I wanted to break out for you um, what that looks like. So in the last, uh, I think I have five years after one, two, three, four, six years, sorry. In the last six years, here's the amount that we generally pay um, in, th that we have paid. These are actual costs, actual costs that we have paid in salaries, benefits. And I've broken out PERS contribution separately because that's become, you can see from 2014 to 2019, that's become a bigger part. Now, back in the recession years, the Department of Retirement Services intentionally um, kept the cost to jurisdictions low for PERS. And they said that we would make that up. Now, over the last 10 years, we've made that up. In 2021, we will see a reduction in the PERS rate for the first time in 10 years. And that is a reduction that goes both to employers and to employees. So we will begin to see some, some savings or actual leveling off of that PERS contribution. So if you could go to the next slide, please. One more. And then I wanted to also show, this is the average cost of employees. The top line shows the, the employees in the general fund over the last, I have to count the years, but it looks like eight years. Um, you can see that we have not grown. Our, our FTE count in the general fund has been pretty flat. Uh, and the cost for employee actually has also stayed fairly flat. Now, a lot of this is due to things like um, retirements. When, when people retire, they tend to retire at the higher end of salary, uh, of the salary scale. And when we hire them back in, they're hired back in at a lower level. Um, but again, it, it also uh, reflects the, I think the austerity of the county in trying to make sure that we're um, managing the cost of our employees. You can see that um, there is a very, I, I would say a, an upward trend, but it's, but it's pretty um, mild in how this, how the cost per employee uh, in the general fund have has increased over the last few years. So that's really the presentation that I wanted to give today, um, but I have a, uh, the experts on hand here. If you have any questions about um, the funds in the county or the general funds specifically, that's just kind of a, a very high level overview of of our county finances. So any questions for myself or Sarah? Are there questions? Madam Chair. Councilor Matt, did you? Thanks, and Mark, thanks for that presentation. We've, uh, the question I'm gonna ask, I've asked a number of times before, and I, I know there are so many uh, funds within the other category uh, that is seeing a downward trend. and. Um, is there some way we can get some fidelity on trends, anything that may be more controllable uh, by us in that other category uh, to reverse that trend? Um, and again, I know it's it's a myriad of funds. I can't remember the number you had told me, but yeah, the, yeah, the other revenues um, were, we don't have a lot of ability to control those. A lot of those come in from for example, our, our fines and fees out of the courts and you know decisions that the courts make on how they impose fines and fees, it certainly impacts the revenue, but we don't have a lot of direct input into that. Um, I would say one of the largest um, contributors to the decrease is uh, the, under, under the 6211 billings, we're able to bill other jurisdictions for services we provide those and one of those is the county jail 
Now, the jail revenues have have dropped dramatically in the last two years, and we don't anticipate those returning simply because of the the um, ability to bill jurisdictions for misdemeanors. We just don't have as many misdemeanors in the jail anymore. They're being released on reconnaissance. There, I mean, there's practices that have changed, um, and the population of the jail is lower. So we don't anticipate that those jail revenues will be coming back. Um, in, in the near future. So those are, I guess, to, to your question, that's not really an answer, is it? How, can we control those? We do to the extent we can, right? Um, but a lot of those are not within the control of, of um, you know, staff or council, to be honest, so. So we have had a lot of discussion on the jail and, and moving forward and recouping some of the delayed billing that uh, hopefully will help us out in the current situation. But, and we've talked specifically about the court. So I'm just gonna use that as, as an example. You know, some of that is kind of behind the curtain. Now you can't squeeze uh, blood out of a turnip, if you will, from criminal defendants. But, and a lot of court costs and fees are associated instead with uh, civil uh, court and I, you know, in my experience, and I talked to you specifically about it, we were constantly reminded as judges to remember the mandatory fines and fees, um, especially in the civil arena where people had an ability to pay. Uh, so I don't know still what efforts we've made to ensure that the, that the judges are reminded that they are putting these fines and fees in places uh, that where sh they should be. Um, I just don't have visibility of it. And I don't know that your office has visibility of it as to what the uh, the court clerk is doing. Uh, we know about the problems in the jail and hopefully that'll be rectified eventually. I don't know why well, it's taking so long to fix that, but go well, ahead. The, the, counselor, the, the, the billings, as we catch up with those, even, even as we catch up with the billings, uh, the ongoing ability to bill will is is decremented we just won't have the the um i i guess the the people um you know the misdemeanors in the jail to bill in the future um i don't know if there is a forum where council meets with the elected judges i i'm not sure how that conversation would take place but you know that might be um something for the council to look at what is you know what is the long term um view of how the courts approach these things uh, a lot of the the fines and fees you know they're things like you know traffic fees are we um actively pursuing traffic enforcement fees so there's a lot of discussion between council and the other electeds that would influence you know some of those um decisions i had a question as well um mark as a, a few uh slides back where you explained what came out of the the uh, general fund and this the uh, citizen services or um, yeah let's see so uh, when i look at that in a way you know this the sheriff <laughs> the sheriff and law and justice is a citizen service uh as well yes. as other you know other things it could all actually be one, almost always lumped together but my question actually is do you have numbers that show the cost of services to citizens in unincorporated Clark County, the cost to the county for citizens in unincorporated Clark County versus in other jurisdictions? And uh, do, have you ever calculated that? I mean, we must have that. Uh I don't have that research, but I mean, if it's something that you're interested in, we could look into comparing ourselves to other counties. Is that what you're thinking? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, of the revenue that comes into us. For instance, the city of Vancouver revenue comes into them, but they have different, a different tax structure, property taxes that come into the county obviously it's divided between other jurisdictions is that not true i mean for instance we just heard about schools and all those other things 
But people who live, for instance, in the city of Vancouver, we don't pay for waste connections for them, or we don't, you know, we don't service them with certain uh, services. So it must cost the county less. Uh, you know, we must get some portion of revenue from those citizens, regardless of what jurisdiction they're in. But when they are in the unincorporated Clark, corporated Clark County, we have to pay for the services that they're getting. For instance, in Hazeldale, it's an urban area. And yet, uh, I, I, you know, it seems like it would be city, but it's unincorporated. And so each of, each of those households receives a certain amount of service from the county. So I guess what I'm, I, I'm, I'm obviously having a problem articulating this, but what I'm trying to say is, what does it cost the county per household versus what it would cost the city per household? And um, how can we change that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And some of, you know, as you know, counselor, some of the services that we provide as a county are countywide services. For example, okay. yes. the, the court structure is a countywide yeah. structure. So yeah. as you know, the property taxes for the for the base property tax, it's countywide. And so that is intended to pay for those countywide services. Uh, uh, you know, one of the the clearest examples of that that we're experiencing right now is the Department of Health. You know, Department of Health is a countywide service that all of the residents are contributing to through their property taxes. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the services that are listed here, for example, um, you know, probation services, courts, clerks, you know, prosecuting attorney, those are all countywide. Uh, our sheriff's office clearly is intended for the unincorporated area. So that might be something that we could look, you know, look into. Um, again, down in the citizen services category, the medical examiner is countywide. The GIS is countywide. So um, community planning is, is countywide. So we're, you know, we're almost in the situation of we have to provide these for everyone, no matter where the city limit line is. So um, and, but I'll, and my, I'll, 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 I can have a conversation with you and we can try and figure out how to do an analysis like that. So um, Sarah, were you chiming in? Somebody was chiming in. Oh, I was just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was just going to say that, and in some ways, the jail is actually considered countywide, especially when we're not statutorily allowed to bill for it um, with the current makeup of inmates that are there. So we are, you know, providing that service as well on a countywide basis. That that's correct. So, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> and we'll and you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to call me later. We can try and figure formulate a. An analysis of what you're looking for. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Great. Appreciate it. Well, we are always available. Any of us are always available for, um, you know, questions or we do have a lot of reports. I know that in the last um, week or two, I've been able to um, give you copies of the the ten year trends report. Uh, you also have copies of the 2019 CAFR. Uh, yesterday we talked briefly about a, the one page report for the <clears throat> CRF Title V money, which um, is now finalized and and I've sent a copy of that to Kathleen. We'll also do a, a similar report for the the coronavirus uh, Title VI money, which is the money that went to DCS for things like um the rental assistance the the prior rental assistance program some of the LIHEAP programs and things like that that's under title six and i'll do a similar report for that as well so that you can see the full picture of what the county's provided uh, as far as relief so okay thank you very much oh. I was just going to say thank you as well for your time. And then if there are any questions that arise regarding debt, 
um, and the county's ability to issue debt or the management of debt or the paying of debt, please reach out to our office as well as if there are any questions about property taxes and how those are billed and administered, um, our investment pool or any of our cash flow um, issues that you know you may have any questions about, our office is always available to answer those as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, does that conclude? Now, do we have uh, Emily here, and is is she going to do any portion or? No, she was able to listen, uh, but no, I think this concludes okay. the uh, finance right. one hundred and one. All righty. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. So, Chair, if um, we're ready, we can have Taylor, uh, we'll pull up his presentation. So, it may not be in the direct order as on your agenda, uh, but he will be going over an overview of the Charter, Board of Health, Roles and Responsibilities, Open Public Meetings Act, and Government Ethics. So, I will hand it over to Taylor. Okay. Thank you, Taylor. Good morning, counselors. Uh, uh, again, my name is Taylor Hallick. I'm the Chief Civil Deputy at the Prosecuting Attorney's Office. And my presentation today uh, will provide an overview of some of the key legal authorities, uh, statutes, uh, code provisions, and uh, charter language that apply to ethics, um, the Public Records Act, the Open Public Meetings Act, the charter itself, and um, at the, the Board of Health. Um, I'm going to be limited in my ability to respond uh, to your to, to questions today because my responses um, to your questions are uh, the subject of uh, attorney client privilege and, and our legal advice. So I'd uh, ask that if you do have questions about the authorities I'm talking about today or specific questions about facts or different scenarios uh, that you please follow up with me and our office so that I can get you um, the advice that the council needs. Next slide, please. So this covers, as I just mentioned, uh, some of the topics that I'll be talking about today. Um, the ethics review, uh, as well as these other matters, will uh, reference some excerpts from state statutes, as well as the charter and the Clark County Code. Uh, the Open Public Meetings Act, um, is also has uh, is where you can find all the authorities relating to the open public meetings um, requirements, the Public Records Act, Board of Health, um, the statutes 7005 RCW, and the charter, uh, as you know, is on our website and highlight, I will be highlighting today the role of the council and the county manager. Next slide, please. To start things off, uh, RCW 4223 uh, governs ethics for municipal officers, such as Clark County's counselors, as well as um, other elected officials. The, I want to note that the requirements of RCW 4223 are in addition to any local regulations that may apply, including those that are set forth in the county's charter. Um, in the the statute makes it clear that you know the charter requirements can be no less restrictive than state law, but they can kind of they can supplement and add to uh, state law requirements. So just to cover some of the high points of RCW forty two twenty three, um, there there are specific provisions relating to contracting interests. Uh, for instance, no municipal officer such as yourselves uh, shall be beneficially interested directly or indirectly in any contract which be may, may be made by, through, or under the supervision of your office as a counselor in whole or in part. I think that's pretty straightforward. We haven't really run into that uh, before, but it's always a good reminder. Further, uh, RCW 4223.070 specifically sets forth prohibited uses of public office. And um, I think it's worth going through those and noting those for a moment. You may not use a position to secure privilege, uh, a special privilege or exemption for yourself or others. 
Uh, you may not give or receive compensation, gift, reward, or gratuity for a matter connected to, with, or related to your services. You may not accept employment that might be reasonably might reasonably require or induce you as an officer to disclose confidential information by reason of your official position. And you may not disclose confidential information gained by reason of your position or use that for your personal gain. Next slide, please. As the council is aware, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, state law regulates ethics. Um, no, excuse me. State law also regulates ethics by imposing restrictions on campaign activities of public officials. And these provisions are set forth in RCW 4217A. And as you might expect, there are a lot of uh, regulations that uh, impact your um, campaign restrictions, but the ones that specifically discuss public officials are RCW 4217A 555 uh, that states that you may not use, public officials may not use or authorize the use of any public facilities for the purpose of assisting a campaign for election of any person to promote or to promote or oppose a ballot proposition. Um, Clark County has also um, adopted um, oh, I should I should mention that 4217A575 addresses uh, public service announcements uh, specifically that they that public officials shall not be uh, in a public service announcement either their their voice or their image uh, between January 1st and the date of the general election um, if they are up for election that year. So that's something to be aware of. I don't. You know, not not immediately, obviously, but to, uh, for electoral purposes, I don't think there's anybody up soon, but that's always a good reminder. Uh, Clark County Code has gone beyond this, or I should say Clark County has gone beyond this by adopting resolution 2006-0408. And in this resolution, um, the, the uh, it's set forth here, uh, the public information and outreach staff is directed to refrain from countywide mailings featuring the commissioner candidates for re-election within 60 days of the general election, unless there is a compelling need to communicate uh, with in in a in through direct mailings due to an emergency or an urgent matter. So this would ref reflect uh, mailings. Next slide, please. Right. As I noted before, uh, state law authorizes and recognizes that local charters may also regulate ethics. Uh, that's what Clark County's charter does uh, as well. And I, there's a, it's kind of spread throughout the charter a little bit. Um, so I wanted to call out a couple provisions uh, for the council to be aware of. Uh, um, Article 5.7 addresses uh, privilege. Uh, for elected officials. And it says that Clark County elected officials shall not use their positions to secure employment or special employment privileges for themselves or others. That's consistent with uh, uh, some of the state law that we read earlier. Again, additionally, county elected officials shall not solicit or attempt accept any benefit, compensation, profit, or advantage directly or indirectly from or by reason of the discharge of their county responsibilities and duties. And finally, uh, section 8.8 .8 addresses uh, elected officials not directly benefiting from contracts made by or through and under their supervision. Again, this reflects some of the state law that we, we uh, noted earlier. And then no elected official shall accept any employment or compensation from any county contractor during a term of office. Next Taylor, slide. I, yes. I just wanted to mention as I, I don't know, there's a lot of feedback. Um, I was going to mention as you look at these ethics, um, um, RCWs, et cetera, and even in the charter, most of them have to do with financial gain in some way or another and using or using your position for that, except for the elections one. I mean, 
that's pretty clear cut too. I, I just, uh, this has always been my view of what an ethics uh, issue would contain. <laughs> uh, you know, it has to do with financial gain and using your position um, in order to gain either power or money. So I just want to make that comment as we look at these various uh, RCWs. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving on to the next topic, uh, a little bit away from ethics, uh, I wanted to move to the Open Public Meetings Act. Now, most of the council, uh, I think all of the council at this point uh, should be familiar with the Open Public Meetings Act. It's chapter 4230, and it's it's quite extensive. I guess I would encourage the counselors, um, to the extent you have the opportunity and the time uh, to review this statute, uh, it can be found um, online, just Googling RCW 4230 will take you there. And uh, I think it, seeing the detail that this statute goes into should give you kind of some sense of how um, how serious it, it it's taken both by the courts and, and the public. So RCW 4230, uh, the first thing to address is that um, the general charge of 4230 is that all meetings, all meetings must be open to the public with very limited exceptions. And uh, the primary exception is for executive session. Now, an executive session is uh, defined in the Open Public Meetings Act uh, to apply to certain activities of, of a public body and of the council. Um, and so that's anytime you're wondering what uh, may or may not qualify for executive session, I would encourage you to refer to 4230 or certainly you can ask me and I will uh, help with that. Uh, the, so that's the general charge is that all meetings are open to the public. The second general charge is that all action must take place in a public meeting. So if the council is going to act, it needs to do so in public, in a public meeting that's been properly noticed. Um, action, have I, is a defined term uh, within the Open Public Meetings Act that is also something to be aware of. Uh, I don't have the definition noted right here, but, oh, it is down, noted at the bottom, excuse me. Uh, action is the transaction of official council business, including but not limited to the receipt of public testimony, deliberations, discussions, considerations, reviews, evaluations, and final action. So as you can see, uh, it's it's quite broad what can be considered a an action by the council. And I also want to note um, that action uh, under this statute is distinguishable from final action. Sometimes that's a point of some um, misunderstanding uh, that that there can be action at a meeting even if there's not a final vote. Uh, some things to be aware of also with respect to the uh, Open Public Meetings Act is that a quorum of the council, um, a, a part of part of a meeting is if there's a quorum of the council meeting together with the intent of transacting council business. Um, this is something to be aware of as you um, uh, you know, work with each other, certainly, um, as when there is a quorum of this council, whether it's in, you know, uh, in regardless of the context, uh, that's meeting together and it's discussing council business, you need to be aware of the open public meetings act. Um, additionally, the open public meetings act is interpreted by the courts have said that a chain meeting can occur when emails are exchanged between a quorum of the counselor that involve the active exchange of information and opinions um, in contrast to the mere passive receipt of information. And I think we've, we've discussed those issues before and the council is familiar with that. And we can talk about it more in detail if you have questions uh, in a different setting. Next slide, please. Uh, related to uh, the Open Public Meetings Act um, in terms of uh, public uh, participation in government is the Public Records Act, and this is RCW 4256. 
Uh, the most, I think, important thing to understand is that uh, records, uh, public records are presumed disclosable uh, under the Public Records Act unless there is an exemption, a specific exemption that is applied. And to this end, um, this is straight out of the, the act itself. Uh, this chapter, the, RC, the Public Records Act, shall be liberally construed and its exemptions narrowly construed to promote this public policy, being uh, the presumption of disclosure, and to assure that the public interest will be fully protected. Uh, as with the Open Public Meetings Act uh, and its definition of a meeting and action, a public record is defined in the Public Records Act. And the public record is any writing including recordings or electronic data containing information relating to the conduct of government or performance of any governmental or proprietary function prepared, owned, used, or retained by state or local agencies. Uh, next slide, please. The, the bottom of this slide was actually duplicated on the next slide, so I apologize for that. Uh, one of the frequent uh, things that come, comes up with the Public Records Act uh, are uh, whether communications that you may uh, receive on uh, uh, personal devices or social media uh, in your capacity as, a, as an elected official are public records. And so I want to just no note that communications like that um, may be public records if the messages or posts relate to the conduct of government and are prepared or received uh, with a public within a public official's scope of employment or the individual's official capacity. So um, that that is a um, fact sensitive issue that sometimes comes up, uh, but I wanted you to be aware that the um, of that possibility. And then importantly, I think another statute that is worth perusing if you have the time, well, I, I suggest uh, perusing, is 4014. Uh, this lays out, along with the Secretary of State's uh, uh, regulations and schedules, the retention schedules for certain kinds of documents. Now, I can, I can tell you that uh, the county has a um, pretty robust um, uh, records retention program and uh, your office as, as supported by Bonnie Lee um, uh, is familiar with these records retention uh, requirements and I would encourage you to contact her if you have any questions about that or myself and we can we can get you answers. I'm getting a note that I have low bandwidth. Is that a problem for anybody? Okay. Um, if it is, I apologize and I'll try to, <laughs> I don't know what I'll do to fix it, but um, we'll see. Moving on to the next slide, please. So this slide provides a summary uh, following our discussion of the Open Public Meetings Act and the Public Records Act of some best practices um, to, to employ uh, as county counselors to try to minimize any issues that we might have in this area. Uh, the first is to only use your county email addresses for county business. Uh, using your um, personal uh, email and phone for agency business opens the door to a myriad of issues, uh, including requiring a search of personal devices uh, for responding to public records requests. And um, it's certainly easier to not use uh, your personal devices for that to the extent you can control it uh, and um, to, to, mi to minimize the need to do that. The second would be to avoid serial conversations uh, about a particular issue for purposes of obtaining the consent of a quorum on a particular matter. Um, this is uh, obviously relating to the Open Public Meetings Act um, and the guidance here uh, is to um, to, to not have kind of a chain conversation about a particular issue uh, prior to the open public meeting. And then third, this comes up from time to time, although less uh, so recently because we haven't been able to meet in person, 
is that if more than three counselors are in, attend in attendance at a meeting that's uh, you know not noticed and open to the public, uh, avoid conversations with more than two counselors. And uh, it's good advice, I think, to not sit together to avoid uh, the the uh, any questions in, uh, on this topic. Next slide, please. The next two slides, um, uh, pursuant to the council's request, I've included uh, to address some of the powers and duties of the local board of health. And the, the statutes that apply to the board of health are chapter RCW or RCW 7005. And uh, specifically the ones I'm going to point you to are 705060 as it relates to the local board of health and the powers of the local board of health and uh, 705070 as it relates to the local health officer, which is the next slide. Um, the local board of health uh, is responsible uh, for enforcing uh, through the local health officer, the public health statutes of the state of Washington and the rules promulgated by the state board of health and the secretary of health. There are, uh, it is also responsible for supervising the maintenance of all health and sanitary measures for the protection of the public health within the jurisdiction and enacting rules and regulations necessary to promote uh, public health and then provide for the control of prevention of any and prevention of any dangerous, contagious, or infectious diseases. Um, this, the local board of health is kind of an extension in, in many regards uh, of the, the state's um, public health directives. And um, uh, so I, I think that's what I have to say about that today. Next slide, please. Madam Chair, I would like to ask a few questions on that slide. Still. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. So um, I, in the past, early on, we had some issues with um, app applying for phases. And at one point, uh, we, we had an application discussed uh, by our director with the director of state without um, any further vote or discussion as to whether to apply for or not uh, to move between phases. Right now, we're, you know, we're looking at uh, vaccine distribution, and there's uh, quite a bit going on with putting together a task force and other work um, with our healthcare providers, working together with uh, FEMA and um, our health department, and yet we've had no board of health meetings uh, whatsoever. So how do they get convened? How do we uh, perform our function that you just outlined? You know, what's the proper way to, to schedule these meetings and to weigh in on some of these current uh, health issues? Uh, in terms of scheduling the meetings, I, I don't think I can speak to that. I would I would defer to um, the clerk and, and Kathleen, the clerk of the board, as well as Kathleen on, on how, how that process works. So we, for the current Board of Health meetings, there's a monthly meeting scheduled now on a Wednesday morning. If the majority of the council would like a special Board of Health meeting, I would just need um, the majority of the board to ask for that, and then we would have to give 24 hours notice. Okay. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> uh, kind of, because uh, I mean, I'm asking for them all the time. At the very beginning of this uh, pandemic, I thought we should meet every day. Uh, and then we went every other week and then they kind of just fell off the radar screen again and uh, without any real discussion by all of the council. So it's urging my fellow council members uh, we are still in the pandemic. We have uh, uh, vaccines now as our top issue uh, and that we should regularly meet and we should meet right away. I mean, we should have meeted, uh, we should have had a meeting uh, the first uh, week of the, of the year. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, related to the Board of Health uh, is the local health officer. I included this slide because uh, um, the local health officer um, uh, in, in Clark County um, is responsible for uh, acting under the direction of the Board of Health to enforce the public health statutes of the state rules of the state board of health and the secretary of health and all local health rules regulations and ordinances within his or her jurisdiction including the imposition of penalties under uh, certain statutes and then also like the board of health uh, control and prevent the spread of any dangerous contagious or infectious diseases that may occur within his or her jurisdiction Next slide, please. This last series of slides um, relates to the charter. And as the council is aware, the charter came into existence a number of years ago. Um, the Clark County is one of, I believe, seven charter counties in the state of Washington. Um, out of the approximately 38, I think, uh, counties. So I wanted to go through a couple key provisions of the charter that relate to the role of the council, the role of the chair, and the role of the county manager, just as a refresher, so everybody can kind of uh, kind of have those at front of mind today and 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 this year. Uh, I would also encourage the council uh, to re read the charter. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's read the charter. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a document that. I think everybody in Clark County government is, is uh, familiar with, but I encourage you to review the charter. It certainly is something that I uh, try to review as much as I can. Uh, and I always um, feel like I, I learn something uh, every time I read it. So uh, just to start out, uh, the role of the chair, uh, section 2.2B of the charter uh, talks about the role of the chair and the chair is to preside over council meetings and ensure the orderly and efficient conduct of council meetings. The chair is the county's spokesperson and is the person responsible for articulating the council's policies, visions, strategies, and plans to represent the county before the governor and the state legislature and other agencies, greet important visitors, and supervise constituent response process for the council as a whole. And that's again all in 2.2 B of the charter. Moving on to the next slide. The power of the council, uh, section 2.4, and there's it's A through H. Um, the council has the power to adopt ordinances, resolutions, and motions levy taxes, adopt a budget for the county, adopt a comprehensive plan, as well as any land use uh, development code uh, to implement the comprehensive plan. Uh, the council has the authority and the power to set collective bargaining agreement guidelines and approve collective bargaining contracts. There are certain uh, county manager uh, nominated appointments to boards and commissions uh, that they, the council can confirm or reject. And then the council is responsible for setting the overall compensation and benefit policies. And that's in section 5.2. Next slide, please. This slide addresses um, charter section 2.6. And this is, uh, this section is, um, oriented towards the council's relationships, uh, relationship with the other branches of county government. Uh, this section says that the council members shall not interfere in the administration of the executive branch uh, under the county manager. Council members shall not issue orders or direct employees, uh, contractors or vendors subject to the direction and supervision of the county manager or other elected official. Uh, as you know, uh, Council members will frequently or or sometimes, I should say, receive a citizen complaint uh, and the charter says that the council members may refer a citizen complaint to the county manager or other elected official for uh, follow up. 
Council members may submit a request for information to the county manager or another elected official. Council members may request information or advice pertinent to legislative deliberations or council action from any officer, employee, contractor, or vendor. Next slide, please. Moving on from the council for a moment, um, I just wanted to touch on the county manager uh, because it was referenced in the county council section uh, as, as kind of the non-interference with the executive. I wanted to go over what the executive's um, responsibilities and duties are. The county manager is the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer for the county and has all of the powers that aren't expressly vested to any other elected officials uh, under the charter. And as you know, the council, the county manager serves at will, uh, at the will of the council and supervises all administrative departments. The county manager is, is essentially the um, chief, uh, the most re the responsible official and the, the, as the chief executive officer for the county enforces all of the ordinance and state statutes that aren't assigned to other officials, including provisions of Clark County's code. Uh, the county manager prepares and presents the budget, prepares and prevents comp comprehensive plans, capital improvement plans, and development ordinances. And finally, the county manager appoints the chief officer of each administrative department. Next and last slide, please. Moving back to the council, I wanted to cover uh, Article 8 of the charter. It talks about legislative action. And it's under 8.2. And 8.2 addresses the enactment of ordinances. 8.2 says proposed ordinances may be introduced by any council member or mini initiative. Proposed ordinances are to be uh, introduced in, its, in their entirety in writing. I think this is uh, to, a, to avoid kind of a piecemeal approach to uh, legislation. Council shall hold at least one public hearing on a proposed ordinance after notice. And I will note that notice uh, is often dependent on the type of ordinance that is being adopted. Some, some types of ordinances provide, require more or less notice than others. Ordinances may be amended by motion without publication, provided the amendment does not change the scope and object of the proposed ordinance. So as the council is aware uh, in the past, there and, and or, uh, amendments will come up at the hearing from the dais, um, and those amendments are acceptable um, under the charter, provided that it does not change the scope and object of the proposed ordinance for which notice was previously given. Uh, if an ordinance uh, receives uh, three votes, then it can pass. I mean, it requires three votes to pass an ordinance, and an ordinance becomes effective 10 days after um, after an, a vote of, of three counselors. Resolutions, in contrast to ordinances, express opinion of items of business or administration within the council's business and does not have the force of law like an ordinance does. And then finally, motions, uh, another area where the council has authority to, to act, um, are you know, neither ordinances that have the effect of law or resolutions that express opinion, but are, are more procedural in nature. And some examples of those would be to confirm or reject particular nominations or appointments, approve loan, interfund loans, organize and administrate the legislative branch or perform other Kind of administrative acts related to your legislative responsibilities. So that's all I have today on the charter, um, the Open Public Meetings Act, the Open Public Rec or the Public Records Act, uh, government ethics, and the Board of Health. And as I mentioned before, if you have any questions about specific factual scenarios uh, that, that kind of occurred to you as I was going through these slides, 
I'm happy to respond to those um, individually uh, or, you know, to the extent it relates to uh, a public records or open public meeting question or uh, to the council as a whole um, in the appropriate setting. Okay, thank you, Summer. Are there, before he leaves, rather than questions that might um, give legal advice, are there any comments or? Hearing and seeing none. Thank you, Taylor. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Before we move forward, I just wanted to check in with the council to see if you needed a couple minutes. Um, for a break. Would you? Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, I see a couple of hands. Um, and I, I just, uh, when we're talking about this break now, something I've been, I thought about yesterday and now again today, I'm thinking, uh, you know, ordinarily on these retreats, we'd be together and we would have a working lunch. We need to think about <laughs> what we're going to do if we want to. Um, as it gets closer to uh, our lunch break time, whether you wanna uh, go get something yourself, bring it back and have a, a, a working lunch, that's what I would suggest. Uh, but I would, I would take your comments about that. Any comments at this point, or maybe when we get back, you can think about it. We'll come back in five minutes and, um, and, and then we can bring this up. Is that all right? I would just answer your question immediately because I know I'm already getting hungry. Uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah. yeah I, I do want to have a, a working lunch. Uh, we could always, to be polite, if we need to, turn off our video and just listen as we eat. Yeah, yeah. yeah that sounds kind of, that sounds good. <laughs> okay, I'll see you back in five minutes. So the next um, item on the retreat today is the vision mission, and strategic actions, which I believe is being brought up right now. And I have a big one here in my possession that we keep around. Um, so this was uh, staff and elected officials and leaders and the council worked on this in 2015 and was adopted in January of 2016. At the bottom of this, there was signatures of all the elected officials at the time and the county manager who signed off on this. As I look at the signatures, I only see one counselor who is still here. Um, so with that said, I just wanna go over this just a little bit. Um, the goal is to go for it, to talk about what it says and just see if the council has any feedback or if you're still in agreement with this. Because my next step is once that conversation is done today, I would like to talk to the other elected officials in my meeting with them with the same conversation and then have that filter down back into our departments as a, a focus and a framework for how we're going to provide service in Clark County and get back to the why we work here and what that service should look like. So the mission that's stated on here for Clark County government is that we enhance the quality of life in our diverse community by providing services with integrity, openness, and accountability. The vision for Clark County is a community with safe streets, neighborhoods, and structures. And just so you know, I won't be reading all of this, but some key, key points on the top. A healthy, natural, and built environments, prosperity, and well-being for a diverse population engaged, civil, and informed citizens, inclusion and acceptance of all people, first-rate infrastructure, a population and environment prepared for current and future job opportunities. And I do wanna call out that in the green area, that when providing the services under our mission, that all of our county employees will act with, with collaboration, innovation, accountability, honest and civil communication, knowledge, respect for one another, professionalism, and integrity, and that all employees will aspire to achieve fiscal prudence, 
community safety, data-driven science-based services, customer service and accountability, constructive partnerships and teamwork, and skilled, innovative, diverse workforce. The actual strategic actions below are grouped into the following categories, community relationships, customer service, decision-making process, employee relations, finance, and technology. I won't go into those um, in detail unless you would like me to, but it's basically setting the framework, like I said, to make sure that we have a balanced budget, to make sure that we're working with in, within those means of the budget, that we're making the best decision, evidence-based decisions, um, that we're working in collaboration with our community partners as well as the community in general, that we're providing the services that our community deserves, and that we have the technology to support that, and then um, in keeping the employees that are providing those services. Again, this I, I do, I have a lot of passion for this because our employees deserve to know what is expected of them, and so does our community. And so we need to ensure that our employees are set up for success and that we have these ongoing conversations and that they have the tools and training to do their job, that we have feedback and then accountability when needed because we, we really need to have this tied in. So my, my hope today is to hear the feedback from the council and then once we have um, a confirmation moving forward, I would like to and with the electeds, but for at least my departments, I'm gonna have them tie their strategic goals and their expectations of what their outcomes are for service level and service um, expectations are in their departments and their employees so that this is actually trickled down so everybody knows what this looks like and that what it's ex expected of our, our workforce. So with that said, um, I would like to ask the council if there is any feedback on what is on here, if you want additional information, um, and hopefully we can come to a consensus to move forward. So are there comments um, of the council and questions, comments? Madam Chair, if I may. So I would be as excited as uh, our manager, and I would I would want to put my signature on a document like this. Uh, in my military days, uh, we would number one. I received considerable education at different stages on how to create uh, a vision statement, and and then in the commands that I had the honor of commanding, we literally would spend days. Uh, of work just on a vision statement uh, to capture uh, what we wanted to do. And I, I'm not saying that what we've just heard isn't adequate, uh, but I think it is important. Um, you know, I, I was listening for the words on diversity. I did hear diverse workforce at least mentioned. I, I tried to pull the document up on my iPad as we were uh, hearing the presentation and for some reason my iPad wouldn't uh, connect and wouldn't pull it up. So what I, I guess the bottom line is, yeah, I wanna see this move forward. I wanna get my signature on it. Uh, I'd like a little bit of time with it. Uh, maybe it needs some revision, maybe some different departments uh, want to recommend something different, or maybe uh, different elected officials want to adjust some of the language. So I, I, I just, I guess I'm not in favor of just saying, yeah, just change the signature block. Let's, let's sign it. Kathleen, how, do you know how long it took to put this together? I would imagine it was quite a Time consuming. I believe it was at least a year. There was, you know, there was a lot of work and a lot of collaboration from all the departments with this process. So yes, it was, I was not um, privy to those, I was not here while they had those presentations and that work to get to this, um, but it, there was definitely a lot of um, communication and collaboration to come up with the vision and mission on this document. Other comments of the council. I, I 
before before other comments go, I would agree that I, I haven't actually looked closely at this document and I, I saw it was on our agenda. Probably should have taken time to actually examine it more thoroughly, but I would like um, a little more time too to actually read and go through it. But um, so I, I'm hoping and and if we're going to ask other departments, et cetera, if we're going to actually have other departments and other electeds look at this as well, um, I think that we should let them know and kind of start that process. That would be my thinking. Uh, and then come back at some date certain maybe uh, because we have this template because it has had a lot of work put into it. I'm just saying that we should have time to digest it a little bit. And, and if there are comments that we want to make or other departments want to make, we should give time, a little bit of time to do that. And so I'd take comments from other counselors if they would please. Chair? Uh, yes, I, uh, I really appreciate this document and um, what had to be a lot of work that went into it and it's very thorough and I agree with um, with what I see in it. Um, I have read it a couple of times. I believe there is a big poster of it uh, in, in one of our uh, county rooms. Um, and uh, I think that it uh, is reflective of a lot of the things that, you know, we, even though we as counselors have a lot of diverse opinions, I think it's reflective of a lot of the opinions that we share. And uh, I would be fine with um, taking a little bit more time for everybody to read it more thoroughly. Um, I think that there is a lot of strong language to, to come to Councillor Medvedji's point. I think there is some good language here on the diversity and equity. We're using slightly different buzzwords now than uh, four or five years ago, uh, but I believe a lot of that language and intent is in this. Um, I would be very happy to um, amplify that if there's, if there's intent to do that. Uh, but um, I would say if we're going to enter into a wholesale revision of it, that's probably another conversation in and of itself. But if we want to take some time to review and come back and talk about it, I'd be, I'd be open to that. Other comments? Yeah, Madam Chair. Council, yeah, Council. Yeah. I, would, I would agree with that. I think um, a, a significant amount of time and effort went into this particular document. And so I certainly wouldn't, I would not be in favor of a wholesale revision, um, but I do think, you know, potentially some review and updates and maybe edits were necessary, but, um, but I think it is an important document for, uh, for the county and for the council and specifically as Kathleen mentioned, how we tie or how she helps staff tie their work to the mission and to our values. And I think um, that adds a level of accountability and responsibility and, and helps students keep the mission clear as to um, what we're here for. So, um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think taking some time to look at it um, without throwing the whole thing out, I think is, is reasonable. Just one quick comment. We've all seen a lot of mission statements and I think that what is uh, somewhat unique about this one, content aside, is the format the structure of it and it's really very nice um, because it it sets up the overall mission and then uh, how you see the strategic action spitting in it's it's really done in a very nice way and and let's be sure that we keep that okay i can um i'll follow up with the other elected officials i have a meeting with them tomorrow the majority of them were here during that process as well and i'll also uh, reach out to the deputies and the department heads and i'll um, let them know that we're not redoing the entire process we're just going to review and see if there's any tweaks and then we can put this on a future council time agenda and get this solidified moving forward thank you mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that sounds good. So, okay, uh, we'll move on then to real rules and procedures, code of ethics, conduct. Um, this is something that we examine uh, on a yearly basis. So, let's see. Um, what we have here before us is 2017. 
This is the last. Oh, so it was 2017 that this was last uh, adopted. That's is that true? As a reminder, uh, the council did do a couple updates last year, and then the rules, and that was with regards to bring items for amendments, possible amendments during the budget process. Yes. And then those rules of procedures were actually um, put on hold and suspended due to COVID-19. So that was the council made that decision earlier. But this, um, if there's any updates you wanna discuss whether, you know, in any part of the rules of procedures, we can certainly look at that for meeting. I think the meeting times and public comment, all of that is included in here. And Kathleen, I also think we're required by the charter to adopt our rules and procedures by ordinance each year. And that, that without, without withstanding the emergency declaration, we are required by the charter to, uh, to adopt our rules procedure by ordinance each year. I just would want to be sure that we're looking at the most current version. I have a printout here at home from with a with a 2019 date on it and I believe we even have from the January 28th 2020 I found an online version so I would just want to know that the one we're looking at is the most current we'll pull up the 2020 um, and I believe that's the one that's suspended right now Okay, so this would incorporate the 2019 language with the changes that was adopted in 2020. Okay, so um, I just was looking for the citing that we actually need to get the charter. Is it 2.5? Well, 2.5 or rules and procedures, yeah. This is Taylor Halvick. I'm, yep. I'm looking at section 2.5 of the charter. Um, I see, I, Councilor Olson, perhaps you can refer to the language you're thinking of when you're looking at annually. I'm not seeing it jump off the page at me here. Me either. I believe we have though. I'm not sure where the language is, but we have voted on them every after we discuss them the this retreat, they come before us to vote on in an ordinance a, you know a few weeks later. Yeah, but I, uh, Julie, do you happen to have a reference to the the requirement that you were stating that we have a resolution on an annual basis? I don't I don't see it under 2.5. I know that we do it. We always open up in our retreats to to look at these rules and procedures again and see if there are any changes that we want to make. And and if so, then we would make a you know a resolution. Then what I'm assuming would be passed with those changes. The only point I would make, Councillor or excuse me, Chair, is that it would be an, it would need to be an ordinance, but. Oh, okay. Right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and maybe just because we tend to do it every year, that's why it seemed like I knew it was in the charter we had to adopt it, but maybe it's just because we make changes. That's why I was thinking it was every year. Julie, I'm having a real hard time hearing you. I don't know if you're near your mic. Yeah, I was just saying that maybe because we make changes every year and I know we have to adopt it by ordinance that it seemed like it was an annual thing that we were doing because we typically do it annually. So what I would uh, actually, so to start the discussion on this, I would ask if there are just really kind of in, in the order that the rules and procedures come, are there, um, questions or I mean or or um, offers of any amendments or or you know so I would I would open that at, up to the council and you had a chance to look and are there things that you would like to discuss as a council uh, of any any rules or procedures that you would like to change I don't want to make any suggestions that would brush up against the charter itself. Uh, I'd certainly like to see 
uh, the chair have more uh, responsibility for the agenda uh, that we have um, tightening up a little bit processes for any resolutions that may be proposed by an individual uh, council member. Uh, I don't recall whether the, the one change that we kind of voted on regarding amendments um, and it was focused on budget amendments that we at least have a time period to consider it and put it before the public before a final vote. Um, is that reflected in these rules um, that that one change? So those are just some off the cuff uh, discussion points that I've had on my mind. Okay, uh, to the second portion of what you were saying, it's on page eight of the copy that I have. Um, and really that uh, in my in my view of how those uh, how that change came about was not even so much that the public had a chance to view this. This was for other counselors to be able to see the amendments. Uh, if there if there was going to be um, an amendment with which they did not agree, uh, it would uh, uh, back one back one. Uh, then the council other council members would have an opportunity to at least come forward with reasoning about why you would not or changes or whatever. So, uh, for instance, the amendment that came about without any notice at all to at least two of the councillors um, was something that changed numbers within the within the uh, budget you know taking from one area and putting in another so that that kind of thing i think that we should have uh, offerings of amendments so that we can look more closely at it really see um if we agree or maybe there might be some other place that if we wanted to add something to the budget we would maybe take it maybe from a different place so we work on those amendments together so that was that was the idea behind that amendment and um it it is showing in this particular uh set of rules that i have okay can i add one more point to what you just said madam chair because um and specifically on the new judicial position which emily uh just uh, was sworn in in, in an investiture process you know I have some experience without about courts and how courts run. Um, and so the other side of this was ha had the county manager at the time recommended that package, I would have had a lot of questions for the presiding judge uh, that we, that I never got into because it didn't seem relevant because it was going to be a uh, uh, denied and not included as a package. And there had been no notice at all uh, that anyone was thinking of amending it to include that package. So we missed out really on what I would have considered a very substantive uh, discussion about whether the court really needed uh, another position. Uh, and I will tell you to this day, I, because of the pandemic, I still haven't met with the presiding judge to actually go through all those questions I would have had. Um, and now he's announced that I, I think he's stepping down. Uh, so anyway, that it was a whole process that didn't occur. And, and when the press asked me about it, I said, yeah, we really didn't have a hearing because it was going to be denied. It wasn't recommended. And so there really wasn't, it was just a perfunctory presentation by the presiding judge and we moved on and, and then the, amendment caught us by surprise, at least two of us by surprise. So, you know, I think the public is entitled to the deliberations of all five of us. And and that so it is an important part. I had just mentioned the other public because uh, the public really didn't have an opportunity to see it and digest it either um, and to weigh in if they wanted to make public comment about it. So anyway, uh, I think we've changed it, and that was the reason for this underlying uh, sentence. Um, and I, I don't know that we need to do anything more about it other than the discussion or continuing discussion on how we conduct business. Okay, uh, actually, if I could, 
I would like to go back and if Taylor's online. And so I, I just want to ask the question. I noticed as I was reading through these rules and procedures on page two under general provisions, uh, number three, item D. I have, I, I, how can it be that if a vacancy occurs in the office of the council chair or vice chair, the remaining counselors will elect one of their own to serve the balance of the unexpired term? How can that be? That I, don't read, that, I, don't that read be? It, I don't read it quite that way, Chair Quiring. Um, will elect a replacement, I see. Following the procedures of the Constitution. I actually think this is not is inconsistent with the charter, and I don't think it was. Yeah. Ever thought. Um, it, this was commissioner language, I think. Um, so I don't know if you're. Are we seeing the same thing? No. no uh, let's see. The same thing. Um, it's under chair. It's under chair and vice chair. Perhaps I have. Item D. Oh yes, I'm looking at a, the. I must. I have must have an older paper copy that I have in my book here from 2017, which probably isn't any uh, any better. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is something that we can review. So I, I just. It, how can this possibly be? This this does not comport with the charter uh you can't name the the, uh, the council itself cannot name a chair so this must be something old that got slipped in here from the commissioners i think that's so, right i think it's left over yeah. from commissioner days and it never got yeah. updated for the charter so, uh possibly the the vice chair but yeah. not the chair you know so that should be amended to to comport with the existing charter language. Which would then be consistent today, with RCW. We can continue to get um, the feedback that the council would like to see changed and then we can go back and make that change, send it to you and then have that on the council time agenda um, for adoption. So we don't, you don't have to worry about um, adopting and without actually seeing the typed changes so we can do that. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would good. say is it would need, because it's an ordinance, it would need to come to a hearing um, and be adopted. I mean, certainly it doesn't prevent discussion at a council time. Sure. Okay. But, and, and that, that's good. We're right now, what we're doing, and we're just kind of enumerating what could be good changes of, of the written text as it is, and maybe if, if there are things that aren't written, um, you know, add additional things. But at any rate, so the first thing then that we need to change would be under general provisions, uh, number three, or excuse me, under chair and vice chair, I apologize. That's number three, vice chair and vice chair, item number D, letter number D, uh, we need to have that comport with uh, the existing charter, it currently does not. We could, a vice chair can, because of the vacancy of a vice chair, we could do that ourselves. But uh, the other, because a person is elected countywide, can't change that. So, I mean, couldn't be done. Um, we might, I don't, is it addressed otherwise? How, how any particular, um, for instance, when I moved out of District 4 into the chair position, that must be RCW that that governed that. I guess that that's yes. what, yeah. So or the RCW uh, um, would have governed that. So we want to go by our charter and the RCWs. So, so that's one item. Uh, do we have anything under, uh, general provisions, county council, uh, of those first three sections, anything else that anybody's read and, um, I don't have the whole thing in front of me. So all I can see is oh. what's on the screen here. Um, and what I tried to pull up on the website was the old one, I think. 
Um, so I just want to make sure we, when we get to meeting times, we have that conversation. Okay, sure. Um, regular meetings, I think, you know, that's set forth. Uh, I think this may be the place to talk about meeting times. It's, I, I wanted to talk about it too. And we, I think, thankfully, have uh, made the language more general uh, as, as far as our specific meeting times. But um, so if we want to talk about it now or after we get through the actual rules and procedures document, I'm. We can talk about it now. I mean, I, it fits uh, with with the subject matter. So, uh, what would what is it that you'd like to bring up? Um, sorry, my mute button was being weird there. Um, I think we've talked in in council time before about possibly wanting to move uh, for for greater access for the public to uh, move meetings uh, to the evenings. But I actually had something else that I wanted to. Uh, make a request of uh, to the council. Um, I have a professional educational opportunity uh, that would begin at the end of the month. And uh, unfortunately, the only time it's offered, it's a three month program, it's only three months. Uh, the only time it's offered is Wednesday mornings from nine to 11. And so I wanted to uh, survey the council and see about the possibility of adjusting our Wednesday schedules uh, for three months. Um, in order to be able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. I, I have a proposal, I could talk about it, but I just wanted to uh, bring that up to see if that is something we could talk about. I'd open it up for discussion. So are you thinking then about moving it, like council to, moving council time and work sessions to the afternoon then? Is that what you're thinking or? That that is what I'm thinking, and I'm referring back to back when we met in person. Our Wednesdays looked a little bit different. We had work sessions in the morning if we had work sessions, and then we broke and came back in the early afternoon for council time. My proposal would be something like uh, if we have a work session starting it at 11 uh, and then a break, because I think we've we've all experienced we've been experienced it just yesterday by the time. We pass lunchtime, all of us are um, ready to jump out of our chairs, I think. Uh, so then coming back at one o'clock for council time and additional materials, or if we didn't have a work session, then it wouldn't begin until one o'clock as when we used to meet in person. And if it works out, we could, we could re retain it. And if it <coughs> is something we'd prefer to go back to, then this commitment of mine would be done in three months. So I don't I don't have any objection to having a conversation about trying to be flexible. Other comments? I, I have I have mixed emotions and I'm sorry to say this. Um, but I think all of us have things that conflict. And um, I I've struggled myself with changing those other items to try to make it go along with our announced schedule. So uh, I think it would be something that would be good to discuss and then we could get clear resolution to it, yay or nay. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, thinking about, I'm sorry, um, but you know, we were, our prior schedule was work sessions in the morning, council time in the afternoon. And um, I would hope that we would be, try to be as flexible as we can be if one of us has an opportunity, to, you know, professional opportunity, educational opportunity that we try to accommodate that. Um, and I don't think it's, again, considering how yesterday went, um, it, we were all day practically in that period of time. So anyway, I would hope that we would be flexible and, and we would do that for any of us. Yeah, I just, I, I'm conflicted a little bit too, because I actually am, prefer morning meetings for everything, both for the council, for the council hearings, as well as, um, for council time and for work sessions. Uh, I mean, if it's, I want to be flexible too. I, you know, I don't want to take away opportunities for people, but this, it seems like it's a little bit more of a commitment up for a three month period than 
you know, a normal accommodation for, well, like, you know, could we move this for one or two meetings? But, you know, because that would be 12 meetings. That would be 12 Wednesdays. So it's, it's, you know, those are my thoughts. Others? Uh, so very generally, I, I treat this job as a full-time job and uh but i remain flexible as to when we've had meetings and we have been uh, flexible to accommodate business concerns and and occasionally like the chair just mentioned an occasional switch of a, of a meeting uh, so i i remain flexible i do prefer um morning meetings and then uh more in the afternoon to answer constituents or do research or go flying uh, to, or hiking or whatever. Um, I think we've had too much turbulence, quite frankly, even before the pandemic and switching back and forth. And every time we switched from an evening to a morning or a morning to an evening, uh, a certain segment of the community complained about it. Um, and, and now we're in the pandemic. We just got an email that the staff figured out how we can take public comment uh, on WebEx or some other platform. Uh, so we're still sorting with these open public meetings and the ability to have the public participate. I just, I think it makes too much of a change. And I, I'd like to know from Kathleen, you know, what impacts staff? I mean, this all has a ripple impact on those that pre present to us. Um, we're just starting to schedule meetings, obviously, and work sessions. But I, so I, I don't know of all those second and third order impacts with staff and and Kathleen's uh, executive side. Uh, so those are my thoughts right now. So with regards to. Um, staff support. I mean, obviously before the pandemic, we did have the morning council time or morning work sessions and afternoon council time. So the staff were flexible. We're here to serve the council and the community. Uh, we did have evening meetings before. I mean, the only difference for us right now is like today, it's Tina and I in the hearing room. <laughs> so you know, so whenever you want to meet, I mean that, I mean, it would, it would impact us even if you were here, the staff would be here. So, um, but we're, we're flexible and here to serve you. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for weighing in and because it would represent a, a large change. That's why I did uh, ask and bring it forward. Um, respectfully, uh, to the comments about flexibility. Um, we all do try to be flexible for each other. And uh, as one of the people who worked on the charter, I know some of the intent of the charter and the creation of the council positions and the, and the restructuring was that these aren't full-time jobs. They're actually designed to be for people who have other interests in the community. Um, so as one of the counselors who has for the last, for me, for two years, um, balanced and managed the other, the other uh, obligations and opportunities and made um, concessions because I have committed to this public service position and so do prioritize it. I'm well aware of having to make concessions and adjust our own schedules to accommodate it. Um, if uh, making that uh, small change isn't something this council is willing to do, I recognize that when I brought it forward. So if that flexibility isn't something we're going to offer, so be it. Yeah, if I could just, I mean, Councilor Lentz is asking that we go back to essentially the schedule we had prior to the pandemic, prior to remote meetings, prior to this last year. We're not, she's not asking us to do anything that's outside of what we've been doing for years and years and years and years. So I would just, I would be really, I would hope that this council would support making a, making this change, whether it's, whether it's permanently, frankly, or for this period of time to support, um, this opportunity, and I would hope we would do that for any of us. I think I think actually what I've heard is there is a, a modicum of flexibility that we'd like to have. 
However, in this case, it seems like a pretty large change for a, a number of, for three months or 12 of those meetings. And it's a change taking us back to what we see. What I'm actually hearing is that potentially three of you don't want to be flexible enough to let Councillor Lentz have this opportunity. It is not a big ask to move these meetings to where we used to be for the years prior to changing to remote meetings. So I actually, excuse that's what me, Councillor Olson, uh, we always have had work sessions at 9 a.m. in the morning or at 10 a.m. We have had um, uh, council time at one because of all of those work sessions, mainly. It was because of the work sessions. Part of our work sessions have, have uh, gone down in number during this pandemic because of the fact uh, that we weren't conducting a whole lot of crucial business during this time. So the situation during this pandemic has been different with our mornings, our, our Wednesday mornings. Otherwise, we have had work sessions in the morning and our council time uh, was in the afternoon because of allowing for work sessions. And uh, since we aren't having as many work sessions, I think it's great to have a 10 o'clock council time since it has gone, for instance, uh, you know, yesterday we started at nine o'clock and we ended at 2.20 with absolutely, I mean, you know, a five minute break here, a five minute break, like two or three five minute breaks. That is not good. I, I you know, it just is too much, uh, I think, to, to, to really work um, well. Okay, so we don't have to continue. We already, let's just, uh, I would say I would be in favor of making the change. I think we'd probably just okay yeah i think i think we did have the discussion and then and then you um uh continued to plea for for uh, something else so um maybe we should get some clear uh yes or no i don't know that it was really clear okay, okay. i think i'm going to weigh in with a clear no it's too big a change i appreciate julie's advocacy and and uh, so i'm sorry it goes against these plans but i think it's too big a change for the public too big a change for us. I prefer the morning schedule uh, with a little bit of flex time in the afternoon instead of the opposite. I have a, a strange sense of uh, being in the unknown area. If saying no is denying Temple a degree or, you know, uh, something that is needed for some kind of special certification that would help her in this job. I, we have no idea what it is. And so, and, and maybe that's appropriate, but unfortunately that kind of enters into this um, odd <laughs> space of not really knowing what it is that we would be saying no to. And <laughs> so I guess, I, I feel like also that it is a it is a very large change for reasons that are unknown. And so I I don't support it. That's really uh telling. Okay. That's, and it's so disappointing, I, but I appreciate the yeah. conversation. And uh I will say that I, I also don't think that it's actually that large of a change. And so the conversation of being a large change and affecting the public negatively is, I think, a little disingenuous. But um, uh, thank you for the uh, for the conversation. Okay, so um, let's look at the idea. I think that you were going to talk about regular meeting. Was was there something that you wanted to talk about about the hearing temple times the time for the meeting? You're, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. I switched to a different keyboard and I am figuring it out. Um, uh, as we've talked about access to the public for meetings, um, something that has come up a few times is, uh, going back to a, an evening meeting time for the, for the Tuesday hearings, uh, for greater access, uh, for the public. And I just wanted to bring that up. We made the switch, uh, during COVID, um, 
I think largely for our own convenience. And I just wanted to talk about uh, the possibility of going back to that for, especially as a lot of people are going back to work. So, in the evening again. Yeah. So I, the 1 thing that I would say about that is. We, I think we made the change because we weren't doing a whole lot of business that the public needed to at, le at first. Anyway, that was kind of the assumption of what we were going to, we were going to meet, but we weren't going to make any major, um, you know, policy changes. And so, so we did change to the morning. We had changed from morning to evening. There always was one evening a month that we had uh, the availability of the public to come down to the public services center. And frankly, I've, I really, uh, <laughs> I appreciate meeting in the morning and with the idea and, and I would also like to add at least one of our hearings um, in the evening so that if people do want to, to participate, if the public wants to participate more and they cannot in the morning, uh, that opens up for more, more individuals who work to come and participate. I think when we had meetings in the morning, uh, when I first came onto the council in 2017, we had a lot of people come during the day. Those same people did not come in the evening. So, you know, I think that we should have both. It opens it up for both. I think there are a lot of people who maybe aren't working, who are really involved in uh, and want to be more involved if they're retired or whatever. So they they come to the morning meetings to be able to make comment and don't want to come to the evening meetings because of whether it's not driving in the darkness or, or whatever. So uh, I would propose that we have at least one meeting in the evening, our six o'clock time, um, especially if we are going to have public input, if we're going to allow that through WebEx, which I saw that email about allowing that through WebEx, but I would throw that out to the council as an, as an idea and see what your thoughts are about that, that we have, um, you know, we meet every other week. We've been meeting uh, twice a month. Is that right? It's, it's really a twice a month meeting that we have, two hearings a month, unless there's, when there's an extra week, we don't meet. So I I throw that out for comments about when you would like to meet for hearings. Morning, evening, both in the evening, both in the morning. Just for comment. So, Madam Chair, I, I think especially people have, out in the community have a hard time uh, keeping up with when we're doing things and, you know, not not all, everyone is so dialed in that they know when meetings are and how to find them. The least amount of change as possible is best uh, for the public. So there's a set routine that people can count on. I, I agree that if we have committees or open houses, public forums, that we should be flexible and look at uh, morning versus evening or evening versus morning. I think you know, it impacts people in different ways. Some would love to come during the day uh, because they're retired. Some uh, are working and would love to come in the evening where that's their only opportunity. But I think consistency is really important. And as to the word disingenuous, I don't know if uh, one council has a different meaning for it, but having different opinions is not disingenuous. And disingenuous is somewhat of a divisive word, and I ask that it not be used wrongly uh, when we all give our input. So we've talked, and I've heard from Councilor Medvedge routinely and, and Councilor Quiring that we want to be as transparent as possible and as available to the public as possible, and we've been talking about having these meetings move them back to the evening. The only reason, again, we're moving, we've moved them to the day is because of, of the pandemic and COVID and trying to manage remote meetings. Um, other jurisdictions, I think, are back to more regular schedules. We're doing more regular work than we were the first four or five months um, where we really weren't allowed to do much work. We are now. Um, and having, and consistency is yes, but that's, that's not a conversation we've been having. We've been having a conversation about transparency 
and availability to the public in order to participate in these meetings. So, um, you know, whether it's one meeting in the evening and one in the day, I don't, I mean, I think having them both in the evening allows more flexibility and access, for, especially for those who work, but I'd be okay with either one of those, but I, but I absolutely think we should start taking um, open public comment now that we have a way to do it. Um, but my other question would be, when we're talking about these meeting times, is are, we're still in a, an emergent state of emergency and suspended our rules. Are we talking about the emergency rules or are we talking about what the rules will be once we're out of the pandemic? And so I think there's maybe two conversations there, but, but, but for me, it's really about access to the public, allowing public comment and for sure having at least one meeting in the evening. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood based on what Councillor Olson just said. Uh, Chair, are you proposing that like the first Tuesday of the month is in the evening, the next Tuesday is in the morning uh, on a set schedule? Because I would be certainly in favor of that as long as it's consistent and doesn't keep changing back and forth. That is what I was suggesting because we used to do that. It was one meeting a month, one of the hearings a month was in the evening at six o'clock. And so, and I believe it was the first meeting of the month because I know I meet for, you know, we meet for um, RTC and it has to end at, you know, like 545 so that we can get uh, 530 or 545 so that we can get back in you know, for our hearing. So that would have been the first meeting in the month. And so that's what I'm suggesting, that we have one meeting in the evening for those who want to participate, uh, for the public that wants to participate then, and one in the morning for those who, for the other pop part of the population uh, that wants to participate then and cannot as easily or more as readily participate in the evening. So, so that we're getting both constituencies that either like the morning or like the evening because of their circumstances. That is my suggestion. And I would say that we would make it consistent. And as far as what we're discussing, I'm I'm looking at this like we're changing the rules for ongoing. We are in a pande pandemic, but these rules we're looking at right now as changes to our rules if we make any changes. In other words, regular regular operation and anything that we want to suspend during this um, time of pandemic, which I'm hoping is going to be, um, is going to wane, especially with the vaccines being available, then we'll go back into this and we'll have these rules ready and ready to go. So I uh, take other comments then about clarifying what I was looking for. I have a, a question on public preference for day versus evening. Um, many public entities do some sort of quality survey to get feedback on a variety of issues, not only how they're doing as a council or as various departments or whatever, but also simply to get feedback on things like, do you prefer day or evening sessions when you wish to comment? Do we have any information from the public other than just a few letters to us that indicate their preference? We don't, do we? I don't know of any. Kathleen, do you know of any history on that? No, we don't. We haven't um, surveyed the community for that, so we don't have any direct input um, yeah. other than if the council's been reached out to from constituents. And, and it's been sort of my experience that it depends on what's on the hearing agenda in a given week. Yeah. And what you know, what drives them to want to come and participate. Um, and the, and oftentimes, if I've heard anything, and I'm not, it's very anecdotal. But if I've heard anything, it's I'd really like to come to this meeting because there's this topic I'm interested in. But I had to take a day off work to do that. And and that again, that's anecdotal. But that's I don't get a lot of feedback that having a meeting in the evening is a hardship. But that's just my own personal experience. So the only uh, additional comment based on what you just uh, what Eileen said um, 
you know, there's three of us uh, that have been sitting on the RTC, and that is just an ordeal <laughs> when they're back to back because there's such a volume of material to prepare for RTC, and then there's no break for dinner. And I mean, I wish there was some way to deconflict between those two meetings. Obviously, the RTC involves a number of counties, a number of uh, entities from from by state, and would be difficult to reschedule that. But boy, I wish there was some way to deconflict those two meetings. We could do that. We could, we could exchange the evening meeting for the second uh, hearing of the month rather than the first hearing in the month, and then we wouldn't run into that problem. Uh, we just have to make that decision ourselves. I, I'm, I agree with that. Often we're we're running from one meeting to another, and I, you know I think we all you know we participate or we will be participating in other committees. Some of which meet in the afternoon, uh, maybe different days than our hearings or whatever. But in this case, I, I would agree we can we can move that evening meeting to the second meeting of the of the month and just have our first uh the first of the month meeting uh in the daytime at 10. yeah okay other comments karen no i'm sorry i so you just I, uh, muted yourself i think um uh that one meeting in the evening is an improvement, so I would accept that. I, I would be in favor of both meetings being in the evening. When we uh, shifted from one evening meeting and four weekday meetings, that was when we still had four hearings a week or a month. Um, and part of the discussion, as I recall, was if we're going to be reducing the number of times we meet, let's make both of those meetings be in the evening so that there is the greater accessibility. Um, I continue to be in favor of that, uh, but if the majority of this council is going toward uh, just doing half of it um, with one meeting in the evening, it's an improvement, especially if we do have the ability now for public comment. So that'll be good. I would also say that uh, if we have more business to attend to, it doesn't have to take place on two meetings a month. We can have four meetings a month. You know, I mean, if we have the business to attend to and the meetings get too long, we just set another hearing, but we give uh, we give public notice so that the people know. But because some of those meetings, actually, when we had four of them. Some of them really were like 30 minutes long. That's it. So there really wasn't a lot of business conducted. Other times when we, we've had, uh, you know, some major hearing. Uh, hearings that had a lot that where people really wanted to comment on them, of course, then they went on for, you know, hours. So, um, so it sounds like uh, the, the council would be willing, though, to have one, at least one evening and uh, one morning at this point when our business is still kind of at a, a, a low level. Is, is that what I'm hearing? I, I think that's that's where I sit right now. And uh, my recollection, though, when we switched uh, to less meetings, I was very concerned about how long uh, the meetings were going and uh, and actually was thinking, boy, we this there is too much work to accomplish in just two meetings. Uh, but obviously, the pandemic has changed all of that, at least for the foreseeable future. So anyway, I, I would go with um, the change. Uh, yeah, I would prefer two evenings, but uh, two meetings in the evenings. Um, but if that's not the majority, uh, one is better than none. Karen, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. The one meeting is is fine. I think um, maybe we'll find out by having one of each how the public does feel. So. Um, Although it, it is very topic sensitive too, like someone mentioned earlier. So um, maybe we won't learn as much as as we would if 
one subject were presented in the day and then in the evening as well. But at any rate, I, I support one uh, being moved to the evening. Okay, so do so done. Uh, okay, moving on to uh, anything else, any other changes that you might moving to page three of this. Uh, Chair, I, I just have a clarifying question uh, to help us and staff related to the timing. Um, will we make this effective immediately so that next week's meeting would be in the evening or how, when, when do we want to make this effective and when do we when do we need to based on notices of meetings? I'd suggest February. We can look at the, and I just want to confirm also, it's going to be the second meeting of the month will be in the evening, not the first meeting. Is that correct? Okay. Um, we'll look at um, anything that's been noticed as well, just to make sure that there hasn't been a hearing notice already published with the date. So we'll look at the 1st of February. If for some reason that date won't work due to notices, I'll communicate that with the council. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we Chair, could. this is Taylor Holvick. I, uh, Kathleen, I, I believe um, some matters have already been noted for February 2nd. I, I, that's somewhat anecdotal based upon the notices that I've seen and signed, but uh, just for, for the council's yeah. information. Yeah, there, there, are, there yeah. have been some noticed for the second, but that meeting will still be at 10 a.m. since we're doing, we've moved the evening meeting to the second meeting of the month. I see. I apologize. My misunderstanding. Sure. No, that's that's fine. So, and, uh, and, also, um, and also, just really quick before you move on, Chair, I don't know if this would be an appropriate time if the council wants to consider go getting some food. It is twelve thirty, or if you want to continue the momentum of the conversation and moving well, forward. Actually, no, no, no. I, I I agree. I was going to finish this <laughs> meeting thing and then go back to you know suggest we uh, take a break. Um, I would say 15 minutes if we come back in 15 minutes and then we'll we'll reconvene. And if you want to turn your um, your video off in order to eat while we talk, we can do that, too. But I will give you 15 minutes um, as a break. So we'll come back at uh, 1245. And so I'll see you on the other side. Is everybody here? Is uh, Julie here? Yeah. Okay. Let's get going then with uh, page number three. Does anybody have any um, changes they'd like to add for page three? So it's I, I okay. had earlier, Madam Chair, and I, I'm not sure where it would really fit in, but I was hopeful from the very beginning when I first saw these rules that I, I thought the um, chairs, as far as procedures go, that the chair really didn't have the authority or mechanism to um, not necessarily absolutely control the agenda, but but set agendas and what what the work uh, that would come before the our council as an entirety um, kind of on the the same framework that uh, a legislature um, committee chair would have a little bit more uh, control over the substance so I, I just thought there should be some more of a detailed procedure as to how the chair hears from counselors on resolutions or um, motions of any kind that would entail staff work and council work because um, it you know it's, it's somewhat vague uh, for proclamations and resolutions etc i'm I'm trying to see <clears throat> maybe where that uh, well oh it'd be agenda basically is be under the no I don't know where would it have you um well let's actually on page four the one thing 
uh, that I see there, page four, item D. That, you know, the county manager has a, uh, the authority to place ordinance resolutions and staff reports on a meeting agenda after review, review of the proposed items with the budget director during their weekly review prior to the regular meeting. A counselor seeking to put an item on the meeting agenda will take the item to the council chair with the support of at least one other counselor. And then all ordinances will be reviewed and signed by the prosecuting attorney, et cetera. So <clears throat> in looking at the charter, and uh, when Taylor reviewed the charter this morning, actually in Article 8 of the charter, so this is, this is where I see a little bit of a difference there, uh, but I don't think that the charter, uh, I just, I guess I would ask Taylor about this, is that it does say, let's see. Okay, enactment of ordinances. Proposed ordinances may be introduced by any council member or mini initiative. Every proposed ordinance shall be introduced in its entirety in writing. Taylor, can, is there, am I reading that wrong? I mean, it seems to me, I guess it's being maybe not, is that being restrictive or proscriptive? I, I'm reading the same language that you are, um, Chair, and proposed ordinances may be introduced by any counselor. Um, my guidance, I guess, would be that, that that's a pretty specific um, uh, provision, and to the extent that the, uh, I, would, I wouldn't recommend restricting that ability of the of a counselor to introduce an ordinance um, by way of the rules of procedure that that's not to say you know there are, there are other things uh, you know obviously resolutions and proclamations and uh, non uh, ordinance agenda items that, that the charter doesn't speak to in the same with the same level of specificity so um, ordinances would seem like they should I mean I would I would I would submit uh, be carved out in a different way pursuant to the charter. You see number item D uh, on page four of our rules conflicting with the charter. I think that um, to the extent an item is def is inclusive of an ordinance, um, then I think it does conflict. Uh, yeah, and T T Tyler, I, I would also add, just based on the issue of consecutive uh, emails amongst counselors, once you require a second counselor to communicate with the chair, that's the third. So now you, you've got uh, an issue with, with communications. I, I don't follow the, ma the, I would count to two there. Well, counselor that wants uh, I, it, okay. counselor supporting it, and then the chair, then you have three counselors. Well, I wouldn't, I would, the chair wouldn't necessarily be indicating their support uh, in that case. They would be two, two counselors that support it going to the chair to and it would be added in, in that event. And also Taylor on that, <clears throat> that wouldn't constitute deliberation or discussion, it would be placing the item on the agenda it wouldn't be a deliberative action i would think but i i um councilor medvigy i guess my reading of the second sentence there doesn't indicate that the chair needs to be supportive of the ordinance but that two counselors do yeah, you know, and I I shouldn't have said ordinance. Excuse me. To uh, the item. <laughs> yeah. So in, in your presentation this morning, I didn't see any 
uh, indication that someone had a support or non support, only that the communication had to involve the issue of an opinion um, or business of, of the county. I mean, it's pretty broad to trigger that consecutive email chain issue. That, it's a it's a it's a good point, and I think that is something to be aware of here. And certainly, uh, it would avoid the issue entirely if if, if that wasn't there. Well, I would. The other thing that I would say, though, about about this whole item, the idea of two counselors wanting to put something on the agenda and coming to the chair. One counselor can, you can count votes, basically. You talk to one counselor, one counselor uh, then conveys, um, you know, that they want to put an item on and they have the support of another counselor. That doesn't, that does not create a, um, for instance, um, business under public records. I mean, you don't all three have to get together to decide that's going to go on the agenda. You just have to get kind of the consent of at least one other counselor to place it on the agenda. Uh, my confusion actually came up when I when I was more carefully reading the charter and I saw that it said any counselor can put something, put an ordinance on the agenda. And it has to be in writing, et cetera. So that, because it conflicts with what our rules are, but um, but the charter is that is it would be the like an RCW. <laughs> it's more. I would I would offer you know, and maybe this is um, just that if if the in that sentence the council chair was replaced. Uh, with the county manager, as counselor seeking to put an item on the agenda will take the item to the county manager with the support of at least one other counselor. That would um, potentially uh, you know, would help with a public record, public meetings concern. But but I don't. I I actually do, I don't support that. Okay, I, I, I just wanted I do, to offer. I that. do not. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't think that it constitutes any kind of a quorum or a public meeting um, problem, if one counselor talks to another counselor, that is not subject to public meetings. If those two counselors know that they wanna put something on the agenda, one of them needs to come to the chair and ask that it be put on the agenda because another counselor agrees with them. You just have to have support for something that you're asking to have put on the agenda and that does not mean, and you're and and you're right, Taylor. It doesn't mean that the chair necessarily supports it. So it's not like gathering the consent of the item to go on. As far as um, being approving the item, it's just getting it getting that onto an agenda. So I I actually don't see it as a problem um, myself. Okay. And I do agree with that 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 interpretation. That's how I think that, that would be resolved. I was just speaking to the to the concern um, that Councilor Medvedji raised. Okay. Although I don't. Okay, so I don't, I don't know if we resolved anything. Do we? <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like there's. I mean, it's good to have the discussion, but it doesn't sound like there's any uh, change to be made right now, unless okay. obviously the uh, Charter re Review Committee comes up with some proposed change for the Charter that yeah. may impact this. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Will you the only thing I would say is we would started this discussion with the identification of the issue that the Charter Say, states that any counselor may uh, introduce an ordinance. Um, so that I think those two, uh, I mean, the charter would control uh, the rules of over the rules of procedure um, with on that ordinance question. Um, so if item doesn't include ordinance, then I think that 
we, we might, there might be some adjustment to be made to that language if, if you want to carve out ordinance um, pursuant to the charter. Um, here's another thing that I just thought of it that right at this moment. In, in reading the charter, I also see that the council can offer amendments to the charter. And this may be an amendment that we, we want to offer uh, as a council. And I think we should be thinking about this during this year that the Charter Commission is is meeting, there may be amendments that we would like, we as a council would like to offer uh, to place on the um, ballot as well. And we may see as the Charter Commission meets or the freeholder, whomever, the commission that meets and decides they want to amend the charter, we may uh, take issue with that and want to place a different amendment on the ballot so that our um, our citizens have an opportunity to choose between the two. So I, I'm mentioning that in passing because we're, because that's something else I noticed in the charter that I had not seen, you know, I didn't really realize before, but we have the opportunity uh, to offer an amendment. But going back to, yes, the charter is the main document. I guess my question would be, if somebody's going to bring forward an ordinance, the or, the charter also states that it should be in written order, sh should be written and everything. Uh, you're going to be using staff time to write that ordinance. And I thought we had rules where at least two or three people uh, had to agree that that that, that uh, that we could use staff time to work on certain things. Uh, does anybody recall having that discussion in the past? I specifically recall that regarding our lawyer, that they wouldn't do any research for us unless we had three votes to uh, ask for it. Julie, did you don't you recall that too? I do, but um, I see count, I see uh, Kathleen might want to weigh in. I, I do remember having that conversation. I just <clears throat> I think in the case of the charter, if if the requirement that a councilor bring an ordinance to the agenda that they have it in written form and approved, then I think that staff would be kind of obligated to do that. I would think, but Kathleen, I'll let you weigh in. Yeah, I think from my understanding, I mean if. The council wants, you know, information that's not going to take a lot of detailed research. If it's going to take, you know, like a full FTE that's doing research and taking them away from something else, we do look for the majority of the council to help support that. But we also know that there's some research that doesn't take very much time and the council needs to get that information in order to determine if you want to bring it to the rest of the council for support. And sometimes there's ordinances too that staff may see based on their experience and um, their operations and support of an ordinance that they may actually bring forward ordinance proposed changes for the council's consideration just based on the operations that they're operating on under. And that's kind of a crux of a problem with uh, how we have the charter because all of the capacity is within the executive branch. We don't have a legislative draftman section uh, to research and uh, do drafting within uh, the legislative part of government. I mean, everything is held, all the capacity is within the executive branch. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have three to go forward, um, but, but it is a dichotomy that isn't resolved without a charter change. Well, and just I would, uh, a reminder too, you have Lindsay as your policy analyst, even though she reports to me and I'm her direct supervisor, she is the, the direct support for the council. And I think the um, on the council time agendas, we always have the policy updates and that's for her to have the conversation with the entire council on what she's working on and to get um, direction and buy-in from the council as a whole. Yeah, and the other thought I had, you know, given, I mean, we have a, certainly a different budget situation than many, many uh, counties our size, and we've had these conversations in the past. I mean, Pierce County has a home rule charter, five counselors. Each counselor has their own um, support person to do that kind of work for them. 
um, you know, we're not small, much smaller than Pierce County, and we have one person to share with five people. So I think it's not so much um, a charter issue that it is a staffing issue in terms of trying to do research and background and get the information that each one of us or all of us collectively might need in order to make the best decision. Um, I don't know that there's an answer to that. I think that just looking at other other counties, there are um, significantly more resources to do that kind of work. I think one of the answers is a budget, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and, I, you know, Pierce County, as you know, Julie, is not a border county. And so they are able to take in more revenue. Yeah. Yeah, I, my, my only point is that it's really staff staff related in terms of trying to get people, like if you were to want an ordinance, you'd need support from staff to help draft it. And, and I would hope that, first of all, we've never used this part of the charter in the six years that I've been on the council. So, um, you know, it's there, but I, I would think we would be judicious about um, introducing an ordinance as a single counselor. Um, a, we don't want to waste our own time, let alone everybody else's time. So. Um, so anyway, I would I would think that there would be staff support if there was an ordinance important enough that somebody wanted to bring it to a hearing. Furthermore, it seems to me that a lot of the times when uh, when a council wants to bring up something, we can talk about that during council time and sort of get a nod that do we want to go ahead and and spend time looking at this. And frankly, I think that is a good way to handle it, that we really should discuss it before somebody drops a, an ordinance on the entire council. Certainly, it seems to me that we talk about a lot of things in council time before it ends up on a hearing. And that's a better way to do it, I think, than, um, than just putting it on a hearing agenda, for instance. Yeah, and I would say, so, oh, go ahead, Julie. I'll, I was I'll just saying, I, I would agree with that. I think, um, I think it's healthier for us if we entertain conversations about different items rather than not have, trying to stop them. So I think generally the more opportunity we have to talk about issues with, within the county and the community as an entire council, the better it is for us and the better it is for our community. So that we have an environment where we um, encourage an engagement in conversations that um, that are important to the to the community. So I would just give an example of it, uh, and that was, you know, I raised the issue of, hey, we need to come start working on uh, our arterial as far as getting a third crossing, whether a third or fourth crossing across the river. And what we heard from staff is, oh, my gosh, that's a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and so that didn't go anywhere. Uh, and that, and then as I was sitting here thinking, because we don't have the staff support and everything's really in the executive, the only way a single counselor, either they're prolific or they have outside help. So then you get special interest, maybe drafting an ordinance and saying, hey, counselor, we want you to drop this on the council. And then it's produced outside of uh, the executive branch entirely. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but yeah, it's uh, an allocation of resources and where the resourcing is, and, and it, it, it is a friction point for sure. And I still do advocate that we should be doing that county work towards a, a third bridge crossing. And I think that's part of the policy conversation that you're going to have with those policy discussions and prioritizing them as well, because, you know, staff is here to support council's policy and to implement the policy. But um, as you know, just from Lindsay's list, as well as other items that are not on that list, there are a lot of items that want to be addressed. And so I think, you know, we want to make sure staff supporting what the council's priorities are, because otherwise, you know, if they have 15 priorities, that's not going to be efficient. We need to give them direction. So. Okay. So I'm, I just want to go back to, we've had a lot of conversation around uh, the item number D, but it's, it seems to me, unfortunately, uh, I think item, and I think that we should uh, uh, maybe distinguish between item and ordinance. 
that comes on the agenda because I would support the idea being council chair that there is a little bit of authority that I should be given over the agenda. And the reason I say that is because I've been in the legislature and th this is a legislative body. I run countywide. Each of you run district wide. And there should be some there should be some advantage to having ha in in the sense of there should there should be something attributed to the fact that I ran countywide and for instance I I have I used to know exactly the number of the thousands of votes more I got than any any one counselor because of that fact so um this is the way committees run in the legislature, and I know this is slightly different, but we are a legislative body, and um, I would like a little bit of that difference. Just, just because I represent, I I had to run countywide and represent the entire county. I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, and I've seen that in other bodies as well. How would you see it in D, for example, um, in the in this set of rules? How did, how would that be spelled out? What additional I, I, authority would there be? I, I actually think that D is is fine the way it's written. If if we distinguish between item and ordinance, since the okay. order itself. <laughs> De so. has a delineated ordinance as the as the quote unquote item. So maybe so. a new letter, a new a new topic here is to the uh, um, the chair's authority relative to the agenda. Is that what you're thinking? Uh, that might work if it if it is in com if it comports with what the charter intended and I think in many ways it does comport with that since um, I'm the spokesperson I'm the you know if you look at what the 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 um, responsibilities of the chair are it would seem to me that it comports with a little bit of that as well so I I'd be open to that Chair, Chair O'Brien, um, to the extent that you're looking for language about how to reconcile this with the charter, um, I think perhaps an introductory clause to that sentence uh, might be, except as provided by section 8.2 of the charter, and then it would continue uh, as is. Um, I mean, assume, I'm, I'm making an assumption that there's not a further intent of the council to change that sentence, but that's what I would a suggest for possible language. Yep. And I apologize. I am going to need to jump off this meeting uh, in a moment to. Uh, was, um, I can Kathleen has my contact information if there's something that really comes on that I need to get back on for. Okay. So before you jump off, though, Taylor, I think there is a further intent. <clears throat> I think we do need to clarify uh, the issue of any conflict with on the ordinance issue with the charter. And so I would suggest, so we don't get too far into the weeds, uh, we'll be here all day and all day tomorrow. Maybe we could, because I support the issue of having more control of the agenda in the hands of the chair. Maybe we could turn that issue over to Lindsay and Taylor uh, to draft, to look at that, uh, to make sure it doesn't conflict with the charter as it exists uh, and come up with some suggestive language changes. That sounds good to me. Does that, does that sound okay? Just to at least examine it. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm just trying to understand what more control that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Other than, other than what's written here, I think you said you're already okay with that. I'm just wondering if that doesn't address it and what else you might be um, looking to add. <laughs> Yeah, I think a little bit of detail would be helpful for Taylor and I. Um, some things, for example, like the council time agenda, 
Um, we typically have just allowed one counselor to put on anything. Of course, the risk with requiring the chair to, you know, have any sort of approval on the council time agenda is that any counselor would still be able to bring up something in council reports. So I would advocate that, you know, it's better to have more transparency so that everybody's more prepared um, than to have to go through the, the chair on the council time agenda. But of course, it's up to you. But I think having a bit more detail on those issues would be helpful for Taylor and I. Okay, so <clears throat> what I would just uh, answer to what you said, Lindsay, that is when I first came on the council in 2017, uh, I had to go to Mark Bolt and, and ask to have something put on the agenda. It did not just appear on the agenda. That was, that was how it worked then, at least for me. And maybe, maybe I was the exception because I was the outlier or something or the new person on the block, but that was how it worked for me. I had to go to the chair and ask to have something put on the agenda, number one. Number two, counselor reports. And I think I would like to insert this someplace in, in these rules and procedures. Counselor reports. In the council uh, during council time should be about the committees that we serve on. Nobody ever reports what is happening in the various committees that they serve on. That is what I believe counselor reports are for. Otherwise, none of us know or hear about it unless it's some big huge thing. And there may not there may not be real significant things that happen in your committees. But for heaven's sakes. That's why we all divide up and serve on other committees. We need to come back and give a report about what committees are doing, how far they are on in, you know, in making decisions. For instance, this homeless um, committee that was formed, we didn't really hear anything about it until and, until it was finished pretty much. So it's not just that. It's many. It's it's RTC. It's it's uh, CTRAN. It's anything that we serve on. That's what I believe councilor reports are for, and not to introduce introduce new items. The agenda should be new business and old business. Councilor reports are for committee reports that councilors serve on. And just to clarify, um, Chair, I do believe in the last year, in order for um, when counselors have specifically asked for agenda items, we have been following the provisions in this part of the rules of procedure where there's two that bring it forward to the, the chair for consideration. Good, that's great. Good to know. Do we have the council time, the definition and, and purpose of council time um, in the, I believe it's in the, Rules of procedure here. Do you, do you know where it is? Is that what you're asking? I don't have, have a printed copy okay. in front of me, and the one online is not the current one. But I'm pretty sure it's in here. It's a uh, Roman numeral four C. So it's back up at the top. So this isn't it, right? Okay, sorry. All right, we're still trying okay. to find it on our end. Here it is. No, it was right there. It was right there. Four it's page three, it. top of page three. Okay, so it just it allows counselors and staff to discuss pending matters, county business in a less formal setting. Um, I, my only reason I bring this up is that while we need to obviously have some, um, some structure, that this is council time is an opportunity for us to talk about things in a less formal setting. And I would think this is the time, the opportunity that we have to, to bring up topics and subjects that we might not 
talk about in a Tuesday meeting, or we don't have other opportunities to talk about as a, as a group. And so I would so I would hope that this is the setting that we would have more encouragement of conversations rather than less. Um, certainly, structure. I would agree. With, I would agree. I would agree with that, Julie. I'm not saying to restrict it. I'm just saying it should be under new business or old business. Yeah, yeah as long as there's not a, a barrier right. to having those conversations. No, that's my, my only I, point. that is I that is not the intent at all. Because I think that discussing matters is the way that you work together to actually make good policy. So, absolutely, I don't I don't want to shut it up. I'm just saying. That it should be on, on the agenda as new business or and if there are a couple of counselors that. That agree that they want to talk about that. Let's let's do it. So it is a much it, it is a less formal and that and uh, a must less formal session. And I think that we treat it as such. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was clarified. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I guess have we resolved the, what was requested regarding having Taylor and Lindsay? Lindsay, do, do you have? I think I do you have any other questions, or does does anybody want to clarify that anymore? What they'd like to see, or whether D is sufficient, or what 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 would you like to do? I have sure. what I. But if there are other comments, obviously any yeah. additional input's helpful. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I remain unclear if there is additional authority that is being requested and what that would be. If so, I think that what's in D is pretty clear on that. And it sounds like there's general agreement that that works. I would say I'd be looking for uh, a, a clause of some sort to do that reconciling with the charter specifically around ordinance. And just if we could have that added in, that that's what I'd be looking for without more information about this specific authority. So I am looking for some proposed language from Lindsay or, or the lawyer or both to see if there's more structure we can give to the chair's uh, control of the agenda. So Councilor Mevaji, just for clarification, are you asking for something in addition to section 8.2 with regards to the ordinance language to be incorporated because what I, I just want to make sure that our takeaway is clear and I thought Taylor um, suggested you know with the exception of ordinances or referencing the charter that that was going to be sufficient based on the conversation so if there's something in addition to that are you, are you looking for something in addition to that yes Looking for. Uh, I'll state it. Uh, something in writing as a matter of procedure at, that we would need to go through uh, through the chair uh, to have something on an, an as an agenda item. I, I believe Are you that's asking what it to says. make what we have more restrictive. Like, can you provide a suggest? Like, I, I, I would have trouble following that. What are you? I'm unclear what you're asking. Okay, sorry. So maybe once we see some uh, proposed language by Lindsay or Taylor, we can discuss it in more detail. Question, who sets the final agenda? The chair ought to see the, the agenda and make sure that <clears throat> everything on it is um, the chair. <laughs> and the county manager. It's, and the county it's manager. not that way now, is it? Or, it, or is it? The, the county manager cr creates most of the agenda in conjunction with the chair for review. I, I believe that's the process. I, I think maybe if that's if that's what we want, we should say that explicitly um, because inputs are are coming from the county manager and to the chair and then how is the final agenda determined so so our so the agenda and it's it's 
stated here in D that the county manager has the authority to place ordinance resolutions and or staff reports on meeting agendas after review the proposed items with the budget director. So we do, um, the budget director and I do meet to make sure that the budget impact statement is accurate based on what the staff have submitted. So a lot of times what the internal processes is if a department is working on a contract, whether it's regulatory or policy driven, they're drafting the staff report, they're finalizing it, sending it to us at least 10 days or 14 days in advance for our review internally to make sure it meets those guidelines. And then I put that on the agenda. And then I review the agenda with all the council on the Monday before the hearing to ensure, but it, it's really work driven and driven by RFPs, it's driven by bids, it's driven by you know things that are on the day-to-day -day work of our, our county. So and of course, if a counselor wants to add anything, um, then we do make sure that that goes to the chair and um, per this uh, procedure so that two counselors and it personally, since I've been doing this in the last year, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, um, I email the chair or call her and let her know that we have two counselors that wanna put a specific agenda item on. And then for proclamations, which are also on your agendas, like you did yesterday, that is brought forward at a council time ahead of time to ensure that we have the, the support to put that on the council hearing agenda as well. So it sounds like the county manager sets the final agenda. I would agree with that. Yes. Yes, it does. It's, it's really it's execute it's it's in, it's executing the work in the county that comes to the council for your consideration for approval. So yes, that does come through the county manager, other than council driven items. Yeah, <clears throat> that does clarify it too. Counselor. So Go ahead. So I think moving forward, just based on the information and the feedback that we're hearing, we will draft um, language in D just to call out the ordinance specific to the charter because that is a different process. Otherwise, I would recommend at this point to keep the rest of the language changed unless there's specific language any counselor or that wants to consider. It does say in here as well that the, you know, the two counselors need to have or one can, unless you want to change that to say anybody can put anything on an agenda. I mean that in, you know, otherwise it's one counselor with the support of another would, you know, let the chair know or what we've done internally is they come through me and then I talk to the chair and let her know that we have two that have supported. So um, I think that process is clarified in there. So at this point, we'll just put in there with the exception of the link ordinance language in the charter and then you can consider that when we bring it back. Is that okay? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. With okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Karen, did you have anything more? No. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's move on then to uh, <clears throat> the next, I think uh, the special meetings thing, uh, or wait a minute, I'm at, actually on page five. There's a typo <laughs> under work sessions. One, two, three, four, five, six. Line six said held, it begins with held. And uh, the word should be time, not time. Just happened to notice that. <laughs> Okay, so are there any uh, suggestions in on that page? I think we are at that page, are we not? Unless you want to, uh, unless you want to um, address, you know, the order of business in uh, council hearings or the special meetings things, which looks like it was, which it was changed. I'm not even sure. Uh, 
Lindsay, I, uh, Taylor's gone, huh? So I, I recall that that was just changed so that we were in line with RCW. Is that what do you in line with RCW for what? Special meeting is what I'm referring to. Just that I think that our description here probably that we just weird. okay. They're just fine. You know, if this what I would prefer when there is an RCW <laughs> cited is if it's not too long, it'd be great to have the RCW cited, actually written down, not just the place to find it. It'd be great to see the language. And I would like to propose that we that we do that. In these rules, uh, especially. The reason that we don't do that, um, and it's actually in contravention of legislative drafting rules, um, because the reason that they don't do that is <coughs> You can imagine if you are a judge and it cites you know, oh, one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, and then it includes the text. Are you supposed to, you know, especially if it includes language that says as today or here and after amended, um, it muddies the waters. And so then you have to go back through with each statutory amendment and make sure that your code, your rules of procedure don't contain changes. And so just citing the code allows for the, the document to continue to evolve as the statutes evolve um, without having to make those changes. This is a pretty sure, I understand completely what you're saying and it makes perfect sense, but this is a pretty short document. <laughs> And we revisit it every year, but that's fine. I it just so I sure if it's helpful. Um, I can definitely send out you know all the text of the RCWs before the council reviews anything, so you have that handy. That'd be great. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate that. Okay, so I think we're back then on page five, the typo. Any Anybody have any proposed changes to any of that? Uh, about the minutes? One of the things I noticed, whether it was here or whether it was in the charter, it was, I guess I don't see it here. But somewhere I was reading that in the minutes, I thought it was, it must be the charter because this doesn't state it. In the minutes, anything that's voted on, it should have uh, cited who voted how on, on, uh, on items. And I think that's important, especially with ordinances, but. Um, Council Chair, I, I think the charter the charter says on ordinances that they're voted on with a roll call vote. I think that's what it states, and I think we do that now on ordinances. No, it was actually about minutes. It it ha it pertained to minutes because it triggered my thoughts about reading the minutes that we have for our meetings, and they're very scant, and do not mention how people voted. Um, so I, I would have to find it. I'm sorry that Taylor had to leave to uh, not help us find some of this stuff. Uh, Chair, the terminology action minutes will be kept is I think what the problem is um, because in normal, like in Robert's rules or whatever, there's no description of what action minutes entail and uh i i think it certainly is appropriate that votes be recorded and so it it's, looks like we should specify that because um if we maintain this language here it it doesn't communicate how thorough they need to be okay i did find the citing in the charter it's section 2.5 rules of procedures uh, letter B, it says, uh, the record shall be retained in the form provided by ordinance and is required by state law for a reasonable period of time. Written minutes shall be promptly recorded and include a summation of actions from each council meeting and a record of votes by each council member. Mm -hmm. That is section 2.5 B 
the last sentence. And I think we should include that in our minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that should be included in the rules and procedures, just as it is stated uh, in what I cited that came comes from the charter. Mm -hmm. So I, I would concur. Okay. Um, can yeah. we refer to the charter in this section 10 minutes? Um, in addition, if there's anything additionally what we're doing with the charter doesn't require, can we just refer to the charter section 2.5, whatever? I don't know what kind of a problem it would be to say that we record the note, the vote. Do you see that poses a problem, Julie? No, I just just inciting like RCWs as the charter may or may not change. If we just cite, it doesn't really matter. I just it would be simple to just say. Yeah, I, actually, I I'd actually like it to state that. And if the charter changes, uh, that, that that we don't have to, we still can ask ourselves. We can have we can ask that to be done, and that's what I'm asking to have be done and stated in our rules mm -hmm. under minutes. Actually, the language that you just quoted uh, would uh -huh. be excellent to repeat right here. Right. It's it's only a few more words <laughs> than what's here. So mm -hmm. I would suggest that we take that very language, that last sentence that appears in the charter and place it there in the minutes. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's taking notes um, and if there's consent, is, is that I? Uh, Councilor Bowerman is in agreement. Yeah. Um, and Amanda G has got his thumb up. So let's just do I'm that. A, I'm in agreement with this. I it, I believe we already do it. I'm looking back at a number of past minutes, and every time there's a vote, uh, I, I'm seeing that. So don't think it will represent a change in how we're operating. Uh, I I'm, I guess I would take issue. I'm not looking at all of the minutes. But I can tell you that I've seen minutes where there's no no recordation of how people voted. So, so I, let's just make sure it is every time. Going on to I'm only going to add one more thing. All in addition to the written minutes, all of our works, all of our council time is recorded for the record as well. So we do have that backup. I, I do understand that. Councilor, Councilor yeah. Quiring, I'm sorry. I'm. It's becoming a little bit of a pattern that I don't get to finish my sentence. So I just, if it's okay, I just, I'm not, again, I'm not arguing. I'm just reiterating that we do have a backup in terms of an audio recording of our work sessions and our council time. So if there's a question or a discrepancy, we can go back and, and listen. So thank you. I understand they are recorded and um, it's just difficult for people to listen to an entire recording to find out how somebody voted on a particular item. So that's why I, I do know there is a record of it recorded, but it's if, if you really wanted to find out how a counselor was voting on certain items, it's a little arduous, so. I agree with the change that we're re recommending here. I just wanted to reiterate that we have another record as well, if it's necessary. And and I apologize for speaking over you. I don't really intend to do that. I my mouth moves faster than my brain, I guess, sometimes. Okay, moving on to page six. Are there anything is there anything here that uh, needs to be addressed or changed? Okay, moving on to page seven. Okay, page eight. Um, I, I guess I do have a point, um, a question, and I'm wondering, uh, and county manager can be in on this, and but but I do think that council should take this up. Um, 
I don't think we have a deputy county manager. And Actually, I, 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 I oh. do have um, oh, okay. a ro rotating deputy right now just to cover for me if I am unable to attend a meeting, which is how the previous county managers before our last one was doing it. So I do have three that rotate through. Okay, great. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, what if there was, what if you were gone for a period of time? What if you had to be out or or something? How how would that be handled if you've got three people rotating? Who's, who's going to do it for you? So each of the three um, deputies have a month. So if I was gone one month, that, that particular deputy would cover for me. Okay, that clarifies. Thank you. Madam Ma Chair, quick question. Kathleen, mm -hmm. prior to you stepping in into your current role, was your full-time job was the deputy county manager? That is correct. That was changed in January of, I believe, 19, and I oversaw the internal services department. Prior to that, I was HR director and deputy county manager, so it was just really filling in for meetings, but there was an organizational shift um, to provide a full-time deputy. And so since you've moved into this position, that is that budget position still vacant? I mean, is it that still is, there? That is correct. It is still, um, we, I did not backfill that position on a permanent basis and a full-time basis. That is correct. Okay, so know, it's still there and not filled. Okay. And I know Taylor's not here, but if you chose as the executive to fill that position and hire a full-time deputy county manager, that's under your purview since the budget position already exists? Or That would be correct. Yes, that okay. would be correct. Okay. Okay. That might be a good idea <laughs> have somebody there to support you in uh, all the work that you're doing, but thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> moving on to page nine. One, I do oh, have a question sorry. on on this piece, just thinking about some of our historical on the county manager piece. If you could go down just a little bit, Tina, the vacancy of the county manager. It says here when the county manager position is vacant, the deputy county manager will become interim county manager until okay until the council fills in accordance with the charter. So um, just as a reminder, when there was a vacancy a few years ago, the council did opt to go outside for an interim county manager that was not the deputy county manager. So I just want to make sure that the council still has that flexibility, that if you want to continue with, I mean, usually, I think at that time, the deputy county manager stepped in until the council decided to go outside for an interim. So I yes, just thank want you to make sure. If you want to maintain that authority, I'm not sure because it says it would fill in accordance with the charter. So I'm not sure if we need to add any flexibility in there um, or looking at long term. And that's up to the council. But the charter does say, I believe, that for any length of time, the deputy will step in. But I'll have to take a look at that. And Madam Chair, before we move off this page, I do have a question. Uh, and it may be to all of us um, and the county manager. But so I have, um, I mean, I spent a life in public service and different entities from county to state to federal government. And it, they were always handled differently as far as reimbursement. Um, I just recently, believe it or not, after two years, uh, discovered that we had a car allowance. <laughs> that I wasn't getting, uh, but that's been rectified. Uh, so I'm wondering with, the, and it's a quite a large allowance. I'm wondering why, you know, other than you're, you're flying, flying to some mandatory thing or, or having to stay overnight, I would think our car allowance would cover nearly all of, the, of this. You know, it's almost like, um, I don't want to call it double dipping, but it seems like it's a portion of our salary that's more than sufficient uh, to cover um, most of our expenses, you know, with, with rare exception. So um, just as a reminder, the council did just pass a policy regarding the car allowance. It's eight, I believe it's $800 a month for the next four years. 
um, and I believe that's for local commute or local travel. So if you were to go out of town, there would still be a mileage reimbursement. So that is really um, for your local commute to meet with other constituents or other elected officials. So just um, for your conversation. It might be. Yeah, and so I, I have that same understanding. I just, I'm just, especially during the pandemic when we're doing everything by, by Zoom, it just, I just put it out there. Um, you know, unless there's something extraordinary, I would think we're already being reimbursed for 95% of our travel and cost. Yeah, the, the thing is, is we won't always be in a pandemic. <clears throat> That's number one. And I understood uh, when the car allowance was enacted or, or given to the counselors. One, it was a, to sort of, well, Julie may have more history on it, but it seemed to me it was to reduce kind of the paperwork, et cetera, of, of, and that we have a fairly large county. We have um, other committee meetings that we drive to, we see our constituents, et cetera. So that was the reason for, as I understand it, just having a, a fixed rate and then of course, when you, I, yeah, I would probably agree that, especially right now, we aren't making a whole lot of travels, uh, you know, um, for instance, from LSC, et cetera. But at some point, we will be. Uh, we won't be meet, reading, meeting remotely anymore, and there may be reasons for this. So I, I don't see that we should take it out, but we should always be mindful of, uh, of this um so yeah, yeah i'll only add counselor that um so i wasn't around when they adopted the actual i think this has been the number for about six years it hasn't changed in, in six or seven years but um but just in my um my personal business life the mo most often it's less expensive for an entity to pay a car allowance than it is to pay mileage because you do have the administration part of mileage and then also the mileage rate itself um can get really high so it's typically um, in all the private businesses that I've worked for, it's just typically easier and less expensive long-term to pay a car allowance. And then with regard to the other expenses, um, you know, those are real too. So, but I think I had to think about this the other day, we're still paying for parking. I don't think I parked in that building twice this year, maybe three times. So <laughs> anyway. Right. <laughs> But I do want that space when I come to the building, for sure. Um, okay. Uh, I can think just, just really quickly on the county manager vacancy, I did find it in the charter. Um, the county, it's under 3.2, the charter number six, it's A6. The county manager shall designate a qualified employee of the county as his or her deputy county manager. The deputy county manager shall perform the duties of the county manager during the county manager's extended absence or disability. So that really doesn't talk about a permanent vacancy. So if if the council's amendable, I can draft some language in there just to make sure that you have options um, with using a deputy county manager in a vacancy or choosing to go outside for an interim. I see some heads shaking. I think we would like to have that. Yeah. If you would do that, that would be great, Kathleen. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to page nine. If there's anything, I'm kind of looking at my remarks. If, if you see anything that you'd like to bring up. Just as you guys are reading in the rules of procedures, for those items we haven't found where there is an inconsistency with the charter, this does clearly state the charter trumps the rules of procedures. Okay, great, thanks. It also indicates the amendments uh, should be distributed five days before, but we, we're suggesting these amendments 
and and then they'll come back to us and we will will act upon them. So uh, as we're discussing this, we'll we'll see the actual language again, have further discussion and then act on it. Anything else for these? We do have the <clears throat> the other portion, which is uh, Code of Ethical Conduct for Clark County Counselors and the, which is Exhibit 1, Exhibit 1. And it, within that particular exhibit, it talks about uh, dealing with um, dealing with uh, complaints, ethics complaints. Do we not? Or do we? Is this where? It... Yes. Number seven. <laughs> Number seven is the big um, is the issue that we have been faced with uh, last year, six months ago. It doesn't work. And we need to figure out a way for it to work. And Lindsay has, uh, you know, sent sent some information to us. Honestly, I haven't. I did have not looked at uh, some of the links uh, to the various rules of these of the, of the cities yet. I'm sorry. I apologize. I mean, but uh, I haven't done that. I don't know how many of you counselors have, but. I guess we can at least begin the discussion, this discussion. Um, so uh, would you like Lindsay to present something? Lindsay, are you prepared to <laughs> say anything or what would you like to do, counselors? I don't think I have anything um, additional to add, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Counselors, uh, what, what's your pleasure? <laughs> In looking over the alternatives that, uh, that Lindsay sent, I found the cities to be less applicable than the county that was listed there. I believe it was Pierce, I, I don't recall. Um, but it was, it was actually, I thought, a, a very good base to use for whatever we end up drafting here. That's Pierce County, you say? I believe it was Pierce. It was the county that was listed among the four. So, so is Linda, you know, I skimmed through what you had sent. Is that one of the ones you had highlighted to us? And if you're able to, if that's one that you highlighted, can you just tell us how it basically functions? Because I don't recall any details of it that is one um and I, uh, that i highlighted for you i apologize i'm not feeling well i don't have covid but i'm not feeling well so i can send out some more information tomorrow on pierce county but i will note on that one that it is um it's more robust certainly mm -hmm. um and with that comes that i don't think it could be absorbed within existing resources i guess is what i would say that's not a deal breaker it's just something to consider <laughs> Sorry, you're under the weather. I don't, I don't, so I don't want to put you on the spot. I, so, Madam Chair, what I would like to do, I'll focus on that one, which appealed to Karen, or at least on some level did. And maybe individually we could um, go through it and see what we think about it and then come back. I mean, this is going to take a lot of work. And I mean, my basic premise is this is way beyond our capacity. Um, and, you know, unless we set up some kind of outside county agency to look at these issues. Um, but any case, I'll, I'll be happy to dig into that one particular one in more detail. Chair O'Brien, this is Kathleen. Can I say something? So yes, just based please. on just based on previous conversations with the council, um, 
something uh, for your consideration to think about. So this was called um, Code of Ethical Conduct, and the number seven is violation of this entire um, exhibit. But I, I did hear some confusion, and I can see the confusion myself that, you know, ethics and a definition of ethical conduct is different than code of conduct, meaning behaviors. And both of those are outlined in this exhibit. So it might be um, something the council may want to consider to split those two pieces out if you choose to address what is ethics mm -hmm. per the law versus um, code of conduct with regards to like a number two. Um, I've actually, there's a couple of them on here about how we're conducting business and having conversations because those are two very different things. And so I think that has driven some of the confusion. Um, so that might be if there's, if the council would like, we can see if we can try to split that out a little bit for you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, I agree completely with that because even as, and that's why I mentioned something when Taylor was going through the ethics uh, issues uh, in the RCW and they're all, they all have to do with financial or some, uh, some kind of gain, personal gain from holding your office. That's one thing. And then there's, there's conduct during uh, and decorum, that sort of thing. I do think it should be bifurcated. Uh, we should ha have both, but they sh it should be um, it should be separated. In my view, I I would uh, entertain the thoughts of other counselors. Uh, Kathleen brings up a good point. I will note that the Pierce County Code is different both in terms of what constitutes an ethical violation and also the process of what happens when one is alleged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, does that meet then with the uh, councils that we should at least start by by doing that? And, I, and I'm wondering, um, I don't even know. I think that number seven ought to actually even be removed until we we can determine how we are going to address this, in what way, and who. Mm -hmm. You know, to whom we're going to give these things, or even if they're standing, who makes it? Who makes these uh, um, complaints about what? For instance. It would seem to me, well, anyway, maybe I, I just won't talk too much about it. It's just, it seems like the person that makes a complaint ought to really have quote unquote standing, as they say. If you were in a court of law, you have to have standing to even have your case heard. And frankly, uh, well, that said, I'm just gonna leave that there. Uh, I do think they should be separated, but I would I and I and we do, I guess, have to at, uh, address the fact that if there are violations, uh, you know, how how do we review it? Is it us or do we go by what the law, what the RCW say uh, that you can't do that? And if somebody has brought that, we need to know how to handle it. And I don't think that number seven is sufficient. It's it's. Well, not only do I not think it's not sufficient, it has proven to be not workable. So we we actually need to eliminate that, come up with something else, which is what we're talking about, you know, looking at some of these other uh, uh, models that we have, either from Pierce County, County or, or elsewhere. Uh, it's too big of a subject to take up today. It should be something that we start reviewing other, you know, other models for this, find out, you know, what we have the budget for, et cetera, if we're gonna have some other separate entity, unless it's something like PDC that already exists and that we would send a, a, like a, um, ethical violation to I don't you know that those are if something exists that we would send these violations to um, 
you know, maybe we could think about that. But. Chair Brian, I would note that we can't send anything to the PDC. They're statutorily charged with their limit. Now, there may be an action that would violate our ethics and also the PDCs, in which case you could craft a provision that says that in the event that it's covered by the PDC, our ethical commission would not convene and would rely solely on the PDC. Um, but we can't just, you know, pay, like do an interlocal with the PDC and have them investigate our claims. Okay. All right. Yeah. Understood. They're, they're there for a specific reason. Um, campaign staff. <laughs> so I just want to note the, uh, and some of these questions are questions I had put to Taylor as far as looking for all the different state agencies or enforcement actions. Those that are in the RCW, uh, you know, the financial gain, the contract, conflict of interest, you know, using your office for personal financial gain and otherwise, you know, those literally are criminal statutes uh, that both um, can be investigated by law enforcement, the PA, the attorney general's office. I mean, we don't need to touch that at all because that's the law in the state and there are bodies to look at it. And I think what we're really focusing on is a process for uh, conduct, you know, code of conduct violations. I mean, we, we definitely should have a statement that we aspire to uh, for all of us, and that should be here. Uh, but then as far as a process, you know, you said, use the term standing. I mean, it's more than standing. It's does it actually state an offense? Is there some filtering body like a PA's office or PA-like entity that would say, hey, we've got a complaint. This is something that comp that we should we, that falls within the category. We need to move forward with it. I mean, that even basic things, basic structure uh, isn't there, especially when there's only five of us and, and the allegations are most likely going to be against us. So, and that recuses right away the person that's targeted. Uh, so this is gonna take a lot of work. And, and if Pierce has done a good job at looking at that, um, we'll have to take a look at it. But so I, I agree with Kathleen and, and the statements about separating some of these other issues that are covered by the RCWs already. So what, what uh, Councilor Lance? Yeah, um, just uh, I think that I would be in favor of separating conduct from the ethical um, issues. I, I, I think that makes sense and is one of the problems with the document in front of us. Uh, the Pierce County information that we received, uh, and then prior to that, I believe Snohomish was one of the counties that we received twice, um, uh, are, go through a lot of the things that are unknowns that we should talk about. And I think that both of those counties do a good job of laying those out from definitions of what constitutes offense to how uh, uh, complaints get submitted and what they have to have to qualify and then also who weighs them. So there's some very good suggestions in there for us to take a look at and see how other communities have done it. Um, perhaps once we've all read those, uh, we can have a discussion about it and perhaps come back to a, a work session to, to, to dig into it a little bit more when everybody's prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I, I would agree that would be a good way to handle it. And uh, what I was just going to. So, with that in mind, let's, let's put it this way. Um, I think that we should. Make a time certain that we start t talking about this, that we have a work session and uh, begin work on it. And uh, I guess I would take input on when you folks think that should be. What kind of a timeline should we set on this? When should we begin it? And should we have a, uh, a time um, at which we would hope to have completed it? Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor. So, so I might, I might um, kind of throw this ball to the county manager um, if there's the work to kind of bifurcate the ethics versus the conduct question and then the policies of 
Sonoma and Pierce County, maybe they can do the work, um, kind of assess how, lo how long that might take to gather that together and then suggest um, a time they could bring it to us in a work session. And uh, maybe if they got a week or so to um, at least assess how long that might take. I don't know, Kathleen, you might have more input today. I don't know. Yes, we, we can have our internal discussions and then look at the work session calendar and then I can bring it to a council time for for your approval to get that on the official calendar. So, and hopefully even maybe by next week, we can at least have the work session date for for your consideration. Okay, and then in, in during this conversation, as Councillor Olson said, maybe talk about what you would, what we could foresee as, as a time that we might be able to complete this just to look at not just us but staff is going to be working on this etc so yes, be absolutely good. so if the council could you know if you want to review the other county information and in the cities that uh, lindsay has sent out we can take that just based on this conversation and at least start a draft of course this is just a draft based on the input and the feedback, and it could be a working draft, but a starting point for your conversation at the work session. Okay. How does that sound? Does that sound good to everybody? That sounds good. I would add one thing, although having the one county is good. I'm curious, Lindsay, how did you come at Pierce? Was that because of a review of other counties and that was the best example or what? Um, that those were some of the examples of best practices that were listed by MRSC, um, so mm. cities and counties. Um, and I always so start there um, to start with the best practice because they have a better knowledge of what constitutes best practice um, necessarily than I do all the time. So um, that's why I picked Pierce County. I, I also usually try and look at Spokane and Thurston and Snohomish as well, just as comparable counties. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have a link to those uh, uh, counties as well. Look and see if they also have codes. Yep. Yeah. Then we'll get a little bit broader perspective. I think that would be uh, good uh, input to whatever we have drafted. Thank you. So chair, before okay. you move on. All right. Would, would, would the council like a quick break? It is 2.10. Um, we're more than happy to keep going, but I don't know if you guys needed a five-minute washroom I, I break. Think, I think a five-minute break would be good. Is that all right? Can we come back at, uh, if it's 2.10, let's get back at about 2.15. All righty. Thank you. And then to our next agenda item. And that is council uh, assignments, the board assignments and descriptions. So the first three, well, I'm sorry, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. The first five we're all on. It looks like. So <clears throat> let's just move to the um, get my a ruler or something. Like emergency medical services, right? Place on my list. Yeah. Right. That's that's the next one, and I'm I'm one of the persons on that because I have to be. So, um, would anybody like to volunteer for that? I'm not volunteering, but. I don't see my initials up there. 
include DJB probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm um, I'm happy to stay on it, but if if it, it meets only a couple times a year, I think. But somebody else is compelled. That's fine. If if that's okay with the rest of the council, anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, C Tran. Um, I'm, I am <clears throat> on that, uh, compulsory and, uh, as, uh, although we had not made the assignments yet, apparently Temple Lance has been <laughs> elected vice chair of c -Tran. Um, so I don't know if anybody else was interested in, on being on C Tran, but I guess I would ask Temple if she wants to not be the vice chair and get on get off that committee. <laughs> but I yeah, I'm not gonna volunteer for that. I mean I, I have an interest in the future, maybe someday, but not right now. I would love to uh, stay on and maintain that role. Uh, we also do need an alternate for it, though, so that would be a, a possibility, uh, perhaps, Councilor Medvici. As long as you promise that you'll never be absent, and and I, <laughs> you know, I took notes on all the things I wanted to join. And anyway, I, if if we need to have an alternate. Uh, I could be one, but do we really need an alternate? Yes, yes, there needs to be an alternate. Is there anybody else who would like to be an alternate? If, if Gary, you know, if Gary's hesitant, anybody else want to step in there? We made it 5.30 <laughs> p.m. <laughs> on uh, the second Tuesday of the month. <laughs> so, And this isn't one that um, a staff could be on. Maybe someone that does transfer. No, okay. no, 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 no. Just can, an idea. If, if there's no other interest, I can be an alternate for CTRAN, but I, I'm not jumping up and down to do it. But if anyone <laughs> else wants to step in, I can do it. But Gary, if you want to do it, that's totally fine. Yeah. So I second the nomination of Julie Olson. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> as long as Temple's never absent. <laughs> okay. I want to be clear. It's the alternate for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, moving to RTC. I need to be on that. Um, and I, I would like to continue on. I volunteer for RTC. Okay. I'm happy to continue unless there's other interest. During and seeing none. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on then to Vancouver, Vancouver Library Facilities uh, Area Board. I am on that. I'd be willing to serve. Okay. Be to stay. Okay, and do we have? Do we need three people on it? That is the that's the facilities board that where we okay their financial. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Weren't you on that once, Gary? Uh, yeah, I was. Thought I was on it, and then we actually had a our first committee hearing and as I was walking to the dais, I was told that I really wasn't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it was just a, a transcription error. I mean, it was on that web page and everything. So no, I was never on it. Okay. <clears throat> Did you want to be on it? Well, that one meets a couple times a year, one time a year. Oh. Quarterly, uh, annually, the third quarter of the year. Yeah, it's, I would, and, I would yeah, it's a pretty short meeting. I would volunteer for it. Um, yeah, it was a weird circumstance last year where 
basically the staff put me on it, but no one had volunteered or worked on it. Okay, so Karen, did you say you wanted to be on it too? I know Temple has been on it. I do. I would like to be, yes. Okay, all right. So uh, Temple, would that be all right if Gary and Karen uh, slip into those boards since Gary thought he was on it once and <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay so Gary and Karen and myself uh, next one is CFAC we aren't meeting is this going to reconvene <laughs> I hope I mean I hope not but anyway let's <laughs> get that well, I think the the CFAC committee is done on how you yeah. want to move forward if that might reconvene something else I don't know but um, okay. but the yeah. CFAC it's committee done. is done okay great uh the reserve officers uh relief and pension board so just to follow up on that CFAC's just going to come off the list because there are some other yes. updates I think okay thank Correct. you So uh, Clark County Reserve Officers Relief and Pension Board, they meet uh, as needed by the Clark County Sheriff's Office. I'm on it, but I need another person to step forward. Gary's on it now, is that? Do you want to be on it or would somebody else like to be on it? Councilor Mevaji, you're muted. Oh. I'm sorry. I, you know, I don't, I thought I was on it for the last two years and I've never heard about a meeting. I've never been to any meeting on it. I haven't either. I'm on it and I haven't ever heard of a meeting either. So. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> well, so if I got needed. Uh, emergency commissioner, I'm the chair. Okay. Um, finance committee. Chair, okay. Chair, chair, chair. Uh, mental health sales tax. I'm on that. Currently, I, 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 I wanted to volunteer for that. I, I, and you've heard me speak up about it because I've been asking a lot of questions about why we have such a surplus of funds still on it. I would like to be on that committee. Okay, so. Uh, then would you like to be alternate then temple uh sure and i would hope for uh regular report outs from committee members mm -hmm. just like i stated in our council time our council reports are going to be about the committees we sit on so do take notes so you can make reports uh school advisory committee uh i'm on that I'm on that currently. Um, I were only, I haven't met in a long time. I'm happy to stay on or I'm happy to let someone else step in either way. Did anybody else like to be on it? Mm -mm. We meet in the spring and the fall. It refers to K to 12, correct? Yes. Yeah. Facilities mostly. It's about I, facilities and planning, et cetera. I'd be happy to do that, but. Um, if Julie wishes to continue, that's good too. Yeah, I'm okay either way. Um, there's a couple other boards I'm gonna need to step off of, so maybe I'll take okay. this one. Okay, why don't you keep it, Julie? All right. Um, area agency on aging and disability. John had been on that. I uh, I I served as the alternate on this and did attend a couple of meetings for him. I'd be very happy to step into that position. Okay. Any okay. Um, and we need an alternate for that. Would somebody like to step up to be alternate for that. I would be happy to be alternate. Is is an alternate expected? Uh, to go each time, or is it just if Temple can't go? It's generally like the way that we've handled it with most of the alternate positions is if, if we can't come. So if I knew I couldn't make a meeting, I'd let you know, see if you were available, okay. that sort of. 
Perfect. Yeah, the, the only exception that I experienced was on the Council for the Homeless, which is one of those changes here. You know, uh, Michael Torres used, as the alternate, used to go to each and every meeting, and he was a central player and really great. And I would go as well, so the both of us would go regularly, but uh, I think that was an exceptional committee. Okay, the Audit Oversight Committee, I'm on that. Nobody else goes, is that right? I think we skipped CJC, sorry. Yeah, oh, I, I oh, like to, sorry, yeah. I would like to stay on this uh, CJC, I enjoy that. Okay. Others, let's see, we have a, uh, and so the alternate, I guess, I'm alternate now, but I'm happy to give that up for somebody else if they need be. Somebody else like to be on that? I'd be alternate on that. Okay. Moving to then uh, audit oversight that I'm on that arts. The uh, Cowlitz arts and education committee, which is now has a different name. It is. Uh, is it Cowlitz Foundation, Clark County? I think it's the Cowlitz Tribal Foundation. Yeah, Clark County something. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in sitting on that if anybody was yeah, Councilor Olson, I'd be happy to, to trade that out. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed serving on it since we started it, but I could step aside for that. There are two. Eileen, do you have to be on that committee? I don't have to be, and if you'd like to take it, you may. I would. Does it still have an arts focus? It has. It, it's it's really much more broad than arts. Oh, okay. So, but still, I would like that. Yes. Okay. Good. Great. Uh, by state coordination committee. Nobody's on that now. I'm sorry, Patrick Quarry. I'm going to, I'm going to step back so we can go back to the arts and Calis committee more, more time. I'm actually going to rethink that. Um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit who may receive funds from this. Oh, group, so I'm going to rethink that. So, um, so Councilor Lentz, if you want to step back in. <laughs> yes, if that's the sole reason, though, I, I would propose um, okay. that, uh, you know, there's there, the opportunity to recuse yourself from voting on a specific grant application exists. So if that okay. were the let's do that then. Let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you could for sure. So okay. Um <clears throat> nobody is on that by state coordination. Unassigned. I don't believe that's meeting. Okay, it's not meeting. Okay. As well as the uh, Washington Investment Board. I remember Julie, uh, excuse me, uh, Jean Stewart used to be serve on this. And they met in Stevenson. I bet they're not meeting anyway. So, unless and until, I guess we would be informed if there's a meeting. Huh? So it's on a sign now. We haven't had a need for somebody to uh, <clears throat> to attend it. So I don't know. I guess if somebody would like to step in and do a volunteer for that, even though there hasn't been a meeting in some time. No. Okay. Well, I guess go ahead. What? Oh, well, I mean, sure. <laughs> it sounds like it's a it sounds like a pretty good gig. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it does kind of, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to Columbia uh, River Economic Development Council (CRDC). So um, this is one enjoy that. that. Yeah, this is what I need to step off of. Sorry. So, yeah, anybody else who wants to take this? I've had this role off and on over the last five years. So, I would love to do that. Okay, Karen. And because I, I know that's kind of your area of expertise. And 
If you serve also on the executive board, I'd like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and so we we do need an alternate for both of those. Somebody like to be an alternate. Okay, if I must, I will be. <laughs> Can't miss any meetings, Karen. Pardon? Pardon? You can't miss any meetings. Okay. <laughs> it's a deal. <laughs> That's the deal for the alternate. <laughs> I'm looking to see when they are. Oh my goodness. I'll yeah. be here. No conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Continuum care board. So can I just go back one, at least on my old list, the original list for Council for the Homeless. Oh, oh yes. Board of directors. Yeah. yeah, that's basically been dropped off with the new joint committee that's been added. Uh, the only conversation I've had with uh, that board uh, is that they are considering still offering a position to the county uh, council, and maybe that would be Michael Torres to sit in as well, but I don't think they voted on it yet or they haven't approved it. So, um, but I, is that, is the new joint committee on this new list that between Vancouver and Clark County? No, it's not. This is only what was last year, which is why we still have different initials. So it will be um, added. So that will be, so you guys why don't, need to discuss that. Yeah, so I would volunteer for the joint um, committee with Vancouver, and then until we hear back from the Council for the Homeless, I don't know if they're going to recreate that original position or not. Okay. And if you need two or an alternate, I would be happy to do that, either okay. one of those roles. All right. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Discover, that's I'm sorry one that I'm that's one that I'm currently on as well and I'd I'd like to stay uh, so um, would welcome having Councillor Bowerman as an alternate so if we also need to discuss further we can do that actually I think originally Gary wanted to be on this and the board overrode my assigning him to this uh, committee, and so I think that it's his turn to be on this committee. I, well, there's two. There's there's two on the committee, so. So so I want to be on it. Can someone second and vote me on it? Because uh, <laughs> so, I got voted off of it last time. I'd like to be voted uh, off to it this time. I need the motion. Somebody want to second it? I'll second. <laughs> Uh, favor. Can we clarify, so, um, can we clarify in discussion, <laughs> Council Chair? Are we going to discuss or just vote? Sure. Or I don't, Go ahead. I'm trying to clarify how many positions are available and what we're what's the issue. There are here. two positions, and the way that the memorandum of agreement was drafted, this is one that does not fall under the charter provision of Chair Plus One. So there are two County Councilor positions on this, and it can be any two councilors. Okay, so we're voting on. Councilor Medvedge's position on this count on this board then? As one of the people, yes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Gary's one on the on the committee. There are two people that may may be on it. I would not nominate Karen Bowerman for the second position. I'll second that. Uh, <laughs> wow, I'm just really disturbed. At, yeah, um, I was pretty disturbed when you guys voted me off, but this is the way it should go. I guess so. Let's vindictiveness let the rule, rule the day. No, I, I wanted to be on it. And you had argued that that district that Councillor Blum was in should be on it as well. So I, just I voted think it's for you to be on it, Councillor. I just voted for you to be on it. I'm not arguing with you there. Um, Councillor Lentz has been on it. I choose a
so we have a motion on the floor for Karen Barrowman to uh, take that second position. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. So motion passes. Moving on to um, our continuum at pair board. Yes, okay. so I don't, I think that's the position I was just talking about. I don't think that's a real position that exists. I'm not sure what that is. They, they currently don't have any appointed seats for the board. So we can, oh, if we yeah. hear something differently, we can let the council know at that time. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I was referencing before. They had reached out to me. I met with them. I talked to them, but I don't think their board of directors has actually done anything uh, about it. So I think that should come off unless we hear from them. Okay. So discovery, we'll move on then to Discovery Clean Water Alliance. Uh, Julie is currently on that. Do you much the preference? Stay on. I'd be happy to stay on this. Um, we meet quarterly at this point, and it's um, yeah. If anybody, I mean, I'm in my district, but it's really about sewer, so it's really exciting. <laughs> well, it's cleaning it up. That's what it's about, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, do you need an, uh, an, an alternate? I guess we don't. Huh? We don't have one. So, Elder Justice Board. I'd be interested in that. Okay. Tempo. And do we have, well, I think we need an alternate for that. Would somebody like to be an alternate? I would be happy to. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm right. Come off. I, I've done it the last two years. Okay. It's a good committee. It is I, a good committee. I, I was on for a year too. Okay. Uh, endangered species. Oh, the Lower Columbia recovery. Gary, uh, do you want to yeah, remain on that? Yeah, it's among my very favorite, and I've been actively participating. And you know, I've now got a nexus between them and uh, ecology and Lacamas watershed, and so I'm generating a some good good Great. work with them. I'd like to stay on it. Okay, and we need an alternate for that. Uh, would somebody like to be an alternate? They do meet, they meet, um, oh, you're doing it remotely now. <laughs> yeah, and um, we'll probably continue that as an option because some of those <laughs> locations oh, are pretty distant. Yeah, uh, but I think, yeah, I think we'll be able to keep Zoom as an alternate. We've talked about amending our rules for that purpose. Okay. All right. So would anybody like to uh, serve as an alternate on that? It's all about watersheds. It's really exciting. It's good yeah. stuff. I, I did serve on it myself. It It is interesting, but. It can't be better than the sewer. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> a hot topic is predation of, of the California seals. So that's a hot topic. <laughs> but uh, all right, no one's interested, huh? Yeah. So you better make your meetings. I guess okay. you can ask somebody if you if you're really not gonna make it, you okay. can say, Can anybody go for me? Okay, <laughs> fairgrounds liaison. Um I like to stay on that if possible. It's right off my backyard and in the district. Hmm. Okay. Is that okay, everybody? Mm-hmm. J O. Got it. Um human traffic and trafficking task force. Is that newly added to the list? I'm not seeing it. I, I 
I, or a JPEG? Yeah, J, JPEG and um, Temple was on that, or is on. Yeah. Actually, it's on my 2020 list. It doesn't have a number, and it looks like Temple is on it. Are you on this, Temple? Is this an existing task force? So, the Human Trafficking Task Force is an existing task force. I don't think it's a, I've been to some of their meetings, but I don't believe it's a formal board, and I'm not oh. seeing it on my list here. Yeah, I'm looking at Jake. Well, I have an old list I'm looking at. Let's see. Maybe mine's old. It is, it's, it's on the list I have, but it's wrong, well, I guess. J, J, JPAC is after Fairground on the one that's on the screen. Yeah, so this one is just added on the list that I have. So we can skip it. If it isn't actually a formal committee, it's just kind of a task force. If if you do attend those meetings, Temple, it'd be great to have reports. I'd love to hear about it. I'd, I'd love to bring them back. It's been hard because they are at almost always the exact same time as our Board of Health meetings. Uh, they're oh. like the fourth, mm -hmm. whichever one, like when we have a five week month, I'm able to go. So. Okay. Nice. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So JPAC. Somebody want? Let's see. I think I can stay on. That okay? Okay. TL. Uh, just a juvenile justice CJC. Carries on that now. And and I would like to continue unless someone is really anxious to join it. I mean that juvenile justice has always been my driving force as a lawyer and judge and prosecutor. Okay. All right. I think that's okay. It doesn't have an alternate. Law enforcement and firefighters disability board, they don't meet very often. And uh, John Blum was on it. So you need somebody to take that one. Chair, this is Taylor Halvick. And uh, actually, the meeting I jumped off of earlier uh, to, to join the other day or earlier this afternoon was this meeting. And they just voted today to change their meetings to a quarterly meeting. So it, it went from not very often to less often. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, uh, you said that was John, I believe. So yes. if you need yeah, me to step in, I will. Okay. The next meeting is in February, even though it is quarterly. It starts in February. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next uh, one. Oh. Uh, did we skip the law and justice? We, yeah, we did. Okay, sorry. Okay, Long and justice. I, I, this is like the last one that I really want to do, I think, on my list. And I we're okay. right in the heart of many issues. I would like to stay with it. Okay. I'm I would like for you to be on it myself. So I hope that's okay. Okay. Um so we we covered that because I didn't, I missed it. So now we're at, um, wow, Metropolitan uh, Policy Advisory Committee, second and fourth Wednesdays at five in Metro Portland, Impact. I think uh, John had done that last, right? Yeah. Temple, were you? Did you ever go to any of those? I didn't. I think he's he's been it since I've been on the council. I was and, okay. Uh, wasn't able to alternate for him. If anyone has a dying interest, then please speak up. I'd be happy to take it. Other. Okay. I know I Temple Lentz for that position. Uh, second it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll put Temple on that one then. Um, Oh, North Country EMS. I've been on it. 
it would make sense. Uh, the only other person that would make sense on that would be Gary. But I, I don't know if you want to do that. He, you are alternate now. I, I well, I've never gone to one. I don't. Um, I'm happy to be the alternate again. Or how often does it meet? Once a month. Once a month on Thursday afternoons from two to four. And um, when when you're not when we're not meeting remotely, it's a beautiful drive to North uh, to Yakult. <laughs> And it's a nice way to spend your afternoon. <laughs> Good bunch of people. So I, I'll continue if. Uh, okay, thank you. If I could just be the alternate. alternate. Okay. Okay, so National Disaster Preparedness Organization, RTP, RDPO. Uh, John was on that. I'd actually like this one. Um, I was on it the year prior and uh, um, I, I, I've kind of missed it. It's a really interesting board and I'd love to do it again. Okay. okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. no objection. Okay, great. Southwest uh, Washington Regional Healthcare Advisory Committee. Temple, you're on that at this point. And I was, and do it again. I was on it previously. Um, I don't know if you want to rotate it or... Twice a year, it's not a huge commitment. I'd be happy to do it again, but. If, if you would like to do it again, I would be an alternate if one is needed. I can't read. Okay. Yeah, there was an alternate. Gary was the alternate. So that's so fine. That. Is that all right? Is that your dog barking? <laughs> yes, because there's a dog outside, and usually I'm muted, but okay. it doesn't make sense to be muted while all of these committees are going. Right. Well, I have to mention the committees, so I apologize. So, um, Temple will be on that as the main person, and um, and Karen will be the alternate. Is that right? Did I right. get that right? Okay. That sounds fine. Uh, Southwest Washington Clean Air Agency. John was on that the most recently, and Dr. Milnick is the alternate. Um, hmm. I've been on it. I'm not particularly interested in attending it, so. <laughs> no volunteers. Karen, you don't want to do that one? Oh, I just can't wait. <laughs> Would you be interested, Julie? <gasps> yeah, I don't really have the time to do it. I'm going to step off this other board as well. Okay. I I feel like I've just signed up for something else on the first Thursday. That's why I'm hesitating. Oh, I see. Hmm. But I'm not sure about that. I should have been writing down the times as we went because they're not second nature to me now. Yeah. Fourth Thursday, let's see. Area <laughs> aging. That's the fourth Thursday. I'm looking for the first Thursday. That may be what I'm thinking of. I don't Maybe know. It is. Yeah. Third Thursday. <laughs> and there's another fourth Thursday. Second Thursday. That's joint. Well, uh, do you want to try it and then sure. if, if there's a conflict, uh, actually let Dr. Melnick know. He may not be able to do it either, but okay. Southwest Washington Convention and Visitors Bureau. I would like that. Okay. That okay? Let's see. Don't. Yeah, Lincoln John has done it before. So. Okay. Urban County Policy Board. 
So I would like to continue to serve on this board if nobody has any objections. Fine. Okay. Fine. It'd be great. Like I said, it's going to be great to actually have reports for these committees because I'd, I'd, I'd be interesting to I'd, I'd be interested to know what Urban County Policy Board does. Washington State uh, Association of um, Wasac Board of Directors. I'm currently that. Um, so what's the difference between that and the next one, the steering committee? Is that a separate? It is different. There's a legislative steering committee. They are very, di they are different. And the legislative steering committee meets and talks about policy, what policy should go forward. Uh, John actually traveled at the time when we were traveling to the, to the uh, um, Capitol almost weekly. Well, I was I was going to volunteer for the steering committee. Um, okay. and I'm assuming they meet di completely differently. So they, they do. Uh, there are some combined meetings where the executive board meets, and so does the uh, steering committee. But the steering committee meets more often during the legislative session. So, do you want to do that? Uh, I do. I was okay. going to try. Okay. And I will remain on the on the board of directors if that's okay. Okay, workforce development. I'd love that. I don't know how you feel, Julie, but I would Yeah, it's great. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. We do, and we do need an alternate for the Wasac Board of Directors because it was John Blum. Oh, okay. I'd be that alternate. Okay. Uh, we need an alternate as well for the uh, legislative steering committee. I've been, uh, I was the alternate before and John did a really good job of attending meetings, but um, I've been attending those meetings over the last three weeks or so. So I'd be happy to be an alternate if nobody else wants to do it. Okay. And so we've got workforce development, both. I think it it's best if the person that's on the council is also on the executive board. Yeah, I'd love I think to do it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And Karen, you're going to love this group. Um, Kevin Perky is a great executive director. They do a really, really good job and they've got a lot of great things going on. So I think you're going to enjoy this. Wonderful. And I love the mission. So that's good. Okay, we, and it doesn't look like we actually have anybody. It's as needed, the Endangered Species Act, water resource inventory. Looks like nobody's actually on that now. Pat Lee, no funding for this board. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we don't need, there's no funding. <clears throat> okay. Mm, Madam Chair, how yes. do we go about uh, finding out for sure when their next meeting is and getting in the in the loop. Oh. Uh, what will happen is the staff will put together the list of who is on what committee and then it will begin to appear on your calendar. Uh, the staff will inform the committees who the uh, person um, who the council member is that is on the committee and um, so it will appear on your calendar. And if it's a committee that gives you uh, materials beforehand, that will be sent either to you or to staff. I, you know, uh, if you'd like it sent to the staff, that's what you should ask and then have them, you know, get it to you or, or whatever. Like for instance, CTRAN, they, they send the materials or give the materials to you before the meetings. Uh, so that you have time to review before. So, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are at three o'clock. This was um, oh, 
We got one more thing and we're we're up till 3.30. So I guess we can talk about this quickly is constituent response process. We have, you know, in previous um, in previous years, we talked about this and when Linnea was here, um, she created uh, kind of a, a she and I worked on something, but she she created the system where she let us she'd let me know uh, how, you know, how things were being responded to. And normally I would say this is uh, the way I see this constituent response process is more about when there's a maybe a hot issue where we hear from many people in the community and s s particularly if there needs to be a council response. You know, I think we kind of talk about that and then agree upon maybe what should be said. Um, Kathleen or anybody, do you have do you have any other interpretation of this? Um, this was added um, per Councilor Mevaji's request at council time when reviewing the agenda. But I can say, you know, with a constituent response, if there is a large response on the same topic, Kristen is um, upon drafting the responses with you individually and responding on the behalf of you, if that's what you choose for her to do. I also believe that there's a spreadsheet that we're tracking that response um, as well. So I, I guess I would open it up to see if there's something additional that the council is looking for, because I'm not, we, I don't think there was an in-depth conversation at council time on this agenda item. So if I could speak up the, um... You know, I really had confidence be previously um, a couple of assistants ago that when a general mailbox constituent question came in, that it was rooted to the correct uh, person within the executive branch, the right department, you know, whether it was animal control or whatever, and that person was basically taken care of. Uh, there's been some I, I'm not sure if that's still happening. Uh, I don't know if everyone is still enjoying trying to find uh, emails from constituents directly to their account to you uh, in your junk email. Um, I think that's a problem that evidently can't be solved because of the software. And so I, I just wanted to make sure there was a uniform process that every constituent got an answer, went to the right place. And certainly if something is dressed directly to me, I try to answer it. Um, so I I just kind of, it's been bumping around. And then we have these issues of fireworks, uh, you name it, systemic racism, you get a hundred emails at a time. Um, I think we just need to have, make sure there's an organized way that either we have, uh, a consensus on what the response should be and everyone should receive that response uh, or um, you know if I'm responding to stuff I don't know if Kristen's responding to it as well I don't know if there's duplicate responses I don't know if that's happening I just want to see if we could fine-tune this a little bit more and as we move okay. go ahead Kathleen you're gonna say no, I can just, um, I can let you know that Kristen's not going to respond on your behalf without you knowing, um, nor will she respond on your behalf without you reviewing a draft if it's the same response from individual counselors. There will not be um, also responses on behalf of all the council unless the council makes that decision in a public meeting. If a constituent does um, send an email through the, the general inbox, those are forwarded to the, the, the correct department. So if it's animal control, it's going to animal control and they are following up. Uh, with regards to the junk mail, I know some of you um, have Kristen actually checking the junk mail throughout the entire day for you and putting any emails in there that may need your attention to your inbox. That happens multiple times a day if you've given Kristen access to your emails. Not all counselors, I think, have done that. Um, and that is a result of us moving to Office 365 because the previous version we were on was expiring. And I think I've mentioned this before, but 
um, what it has been explained to me is they are more conservative initially through Office 365 with the emails coming in until the, it, the system starts seeing a normal pattern. So over time, you'll see less emails going to your junk mail, um, but it's for security reasons and for spam and for phishing attempts. So it is within the system for security, but if you're receiving an email um, directly from a constituent that's going in junk mail, the system should see that, and over time, those emails in the junk mail will decrease. But in the meantime, if you've given Kristen access to that, she is checking it multiple times a day and moving those those specific emails to you to your inbox. So thanks for all that, Kathleen. I have much greater confidence. Now, there's one remaining issue, and, and so you never know if it's true or not, but I do get constituent emails from time to time that say, hey, I've contacted whatever the staff is, and I've never gotten a response back. Uh, is there any way, and it certainly I don't know if that's true. I mean, I've had an experience with uh, a constituent absolutely blasting me for never responding to him for the last three years. And part of it had to, and I researched his name and it, it never came up. So we, I mean, he had never contacted me. But do we have a follow-up procedure where whoever the email is directed to, they it's followed up to make sure they were responded to? Are you are you asking Gary if somebody's checking to see if you responded? Not yet. I'm asking now generally when when it's diverted to the right place, whether it's animal control or wherever, is there any kind of mechanism in place to make sure that it is responded to? So, Madam Chair, <laughs> so this is kind of my um, question about constituent response in that if I get an email from a constituent about a particular issue, it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be animal control, it could be permitting, it could be whatever. Um, you know, it's not my job to fix that problem, but it's but what process do we go through to make sure that problem is addressed via Kathleen and via staff in a consistent way? And I know in the past there was actually you know a staff person who kind of handled these types of issues and sort of was a an ombudsman of sorts for constituent issues I don't, i'm not suggesting that we do that but if there's just some consistent process if we get a, a constituent complaint issue then i'm going to send it to kristen and kathleen and they're going to i mean we can respond obviously saying i'm going to do this i'm sending it through our channels and you should receive a response but that that there's a process in place that we do that so it's kathleen or kristen and then it's to the department or i don't know what that is but but that's kind of what I would be looking for, rather than being the person who carries the flag for each of these constituents on each of their issues when I can't really fix it, unless it's a code thing that we can talk about. But, but that there's a process that we can all go through that staff can depend on and, and we all are kind of doing the same thing. I, I appreciate that. The one thing that I would say though it, uh, is, to be cautious, I think that if we copy Kathleen on it, the function of Kathleen getting this is that she knows what is happening and that it's not her responsibility to actually act on it, although she is the supervisor of the person to whom it should go, for instance, in the various departments. And I would see that her being copied on it should alert that particular staff member uh, to the fact that, you know, th their ultimate supervisor is watching to see uh, <clears throat> that this uh, communication has gone through her, or at least she's seen it. That said, um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is, and I guess that is the question then. Do we have any kind of tracking uh, that a particular issue has been answered and yes so so okay. when a, a concern comes through and it's forwarded to the department kristen does keep a spreadsheet on that and the departments are supposed to be following up with kristen letting them know it's been taken care of a lot of times i mean i know for me if i get a, a direct email from a counselor um i send it to the department head and they're usually copying me and the counselor on their response because it, I think it, it raises it a level when I'm forwarding it to them versus Kristen. So 
So, you know, and if they're seeing it from a counselor, but I can certainly remind, I still meet with the departments twice a week, all of them, including elected offices, and I can certainly remind them to make sure that they're closing the loop with Kristen. And I will also be mindful that if I'm getting concerns sent to me from a counselor, that I'm also copying Kristen on that communication to the department head so it's tracked on that spreadsheet. So quick question, if I might. So, so Kathleen, if we should we copy Kristen then as well? So let's say I get a question about a, um, I don't know, a dog, whatever. I don't know. I get a question about something, and I copy you, send it to the department. Should I? Should we copy Kristen as well, just to make sure that she's in? in yes. If you can, if, if you can remember to copy Kristen and Tina, that would be really helpful. If not, I'll, I will look at it myself and just make sure that um, they're on there as well. How about when it's a more convoluted issue, not an unanswered email, but something that has been dragging on, maybe I got one yesterday that's been dragging on for two years um, in a particular department and um, now he's gonna litigate and that kind of thing. So I intended to send that uh, to you when we're done and uh, to you, Kathleen, and I'm looking at you, you didn't know that, <laughs> to send that to Kathleen, uh, but I wouldn't feel like I should copy the department chair in that regard because it's just too much. I think it, it's in your domain. Is that correct? If you're comfortable, that, that, that works for me because there, there may be an answer and there may be a reason or there may be a, certainly an issue that we need to address. So yes, if something has been, I mean, yeah. there's, I mean, unfortunately, some of the, I, well, I hope most of the constituent concerns come in are minor and that we're able to address them very quickly, but there are some that I'm having to get involved with. That I have to get involved with to ensure that it's being addressed um, because it hasn't been addressed appropriately. So yes, it would be appropriate if there's a concern um, with the overall function that's been taking that long. And if you have any questions, just send it to me, and we'll get it to the right person. And yeah, I'll make sure it's taken care of. Somehow it doesn't feel right to copy Kristen, but I'll do it if you want. If you think that's good. Or, or how about Tina? Because Tina actually, doesn't she handle your things direct, more directly, uh, Kathleen? Yes, Tina and I work very closely together. So, um, you know, other than yes. executive session matters or things that we talk about one-on-one -on -one confidentially, she she's in the loop and knows, and sometimes she can actually find the answer better than I can. She's, she's a great resource, so yes. Um, she is a, definitely my confidential employee that you can use. I have a quick question on this though. Since um, Karen mentioned um, potential litigation, I don't know if Taylor has any um, uh, um, you know, thoughts as well with regard to something like that. Certainly um, you, can, you can forward information pertaining to potential litigation uh, to, to our office. Um, I would again note, as I have before, uh, that you, you identify uh, any legal issues with an attorney client privilege uh, communication label, just so that that can be identified. Okay. And I would recommend not including Kristen or other staff on attorney client privilege just to maintain that privilege and the confidentiality. Right. Nothing against Kristen, just the protection of the data. Does okay. That, does that um, answer all the questions regarding constituent response process? I just want to make sure we're getting everything. Okay. Yeah, covers it for me. Gr great discussion, and it's nice to know all these pieces are in place. Okay, any further discussion on on this or and and I think I think uh even though we have a you know to be determined part two, et cetera, uh we don't have time to to take up a council policy project review at this point. We're at three fourteen and we were scheduled to be finished at three thirty. Does that meet with your approval, Council? 
Yeah. Okay. What we will do then is uh, we'll see to it that we <clears throat> set up a time in the very near future to discuss this council policy project review uh, and, and the various little bullet points under that and discuss further. Um, the, I see the other thing listed on here is the economic development position. Do we have time to say anything about that? We have four, we have 15 minutes. So would, can we take some comments on that? I, <laughs> so just as a reminder, this position is um, in the council county manager office. It reports directly to me, but in direct support of the council for economic development. I believe this was uh, developed early last year or late in 2019. We did have um, an employee, a short-term employee, and then they left and then within a reasonable amount of time, the pandemic hit and then that position was not filled. So it is still a vacant position and just um, seeing, and I, one thing um, that I could ask, you know, Councillor Olson, because I know you're on CRADC and others is, you know, how this position is different than the support that we're getting from CRADC versus our own economic development position. But just I wanna see if the council has any feedback on that position, if you wanna move forward with a recruitment with that for that position, um, and we can work through that process with you. So, uh, I would only, yeah, just add, I mean, we had this position was filled when I was first on the council. We had this position, somebody, I think Jeff Swanson was in this role at the time. Um, but then in addition to interacting with CRDC and, and ICC and others in the community, I think taking the county's um, lead and you think about what we're ha what's going to be happening at 179th and what opportunities there are to um, to collaborate with our development community and um, and look at ways that we can drive economic development here in the county, I think this position would be critical to that. So I would hope that um, we could move on this uh, in 2021 for sure. And that is one of the reasons it sparked my interest. And you just mentioned 179th because the mod has been talking about 179th in the development and looking at their own economic development and that kind of triggered my mind of we have a county economic development position that's going to represent the council's um, purview. And with that development, I'm not knowing how quickly it's going to move with some of the the revenue challenges that we might see, but um, we I wanna make sure that your interests are involved with that as soon as possible and that decisions aren't made at a department level regarding that economic development opportunity. Madam Chair, sure if I could just throw one more thing in real quick. So also in addition to that, we're having this heritage farm discussion. Um, and we've also got the Highway 99 corridor that's um, you know got a complete overlay on it. And there's still economic development opportunities there where we have. So there's just, I think, a lot of opportunity in Clark County that if we have somebody really focused on driving that mission, that we could generate some, um, some real energy behind that. Is the job description for that position online already, Kathleen? I'll have to look. I think it was under a classification of a policy analyst with economic development focus, but we do have it from the previous posting, so I'll find it and send it to all of you. Thank you. So I, I would just ditto what uh, Julie said, and there's a lot of inertia going forward. And, you know, we went through CREC to, to see if we can do get more focus on county uh, outreach and now we have and I'm was it now I don't remember the name of the group not the Chamber of Commerce but uh, Sean and uh, Jim Main presented to each of us ICC yeah ICC yeah I mean I that's exactly uh, the kind of inertia we need for all the county and so this position for us embedded in our command center if you will I think is absolutely critical to tie what we do, what the executive does. And I mean, the one thing we can't control with housing development is bringing in the commercial. And boy, we really need a lot of emphasis in all of our development areas through all of our discovery corridor and elsewhere. So if we, if we can put it, if we can absorb it in the budget, 
uh, I think we need to re-advertise it again and get a great person in there. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I have felt like we've needed this position since I came on. And so um, I think it would be great to have this. Uh, so I, I agree, we should be, we should be looking right away <laughs> and, <clears throat> and working toward, you know, having, having a way to really um, uh, try to get, you know, try to entice, I guess, is, is some way we need to talk about that and figure out what, what are good things um, aside from maybe tax benefits. Uh, we might, we might have some expedited permits and that kind of thing too, but I just think it's necessary. Our county is, uh, is ready for this past ready really. So that'd be great. I think we have a pretty much agreement. I, Temple, I didn't hear from you, but I would imagine. Um, so let me hear from you. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm fine with it. Okay, so um, let's get that going. Okay, well, we will, uh, I think what we'll do then, maybe the ne our next um, council time, we'll talk about what we're going to do for the county, uh, the policy issues. What, what's your um, preference on when we should do this? Should we do this? Uh, would an, an hour be sufficient, like as a work session type thing? We'll take a look at the council's calendars and agendas over the next week, um, and I can communicate, or Kristen will communicate with you regarding what will work best for your calendar. But I do think a dedicated time for it would be like a work session or just a continuation of this retreat so that you guys can have your conversation. And so one thing before you log off as well with regards to the ability um, to bring in community um, input and feedback during council time, uh, if you are amendable, we would like to try it um, to make sure we have, we've tried it internally, the staff have and been able to work through it, but on Tuesday's hearing, it is a very light agenda on Tuesday. So. Um, if the council is okay with that, we can get the advertisement out there to reflect um, the new way for them to log in and get those instructions on how to raise your hand. That sounds great. Yes, thank you. So, sorry, so, Kathleen, did you mean council hearings, not council time? You said council time. I just, I know what you meant, but I just. Yes, yes. Tuesday's council council Hearing. meeting okay yes the, on okay. tuesday's council meeting it has a light agenda and yes because council, council time we actually don't accept public comments for council time but for the council meeting on tuesday is when we would like to to open it up to the community and um, hopefully we won't have any hiccups but if we do we'll learn from them and get it ready for the next one okay all right uh, madam chair Councilor Bowman. My agenda shows county manager goals remain on the agenda as well. Is that correct? Not for today. It oh, really? For another day. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I'm, we're yeah. looking forward to hear it is why I mentioned yes. that. <laughs> yes, so we will, uh, that'll be something that we set a, aside a time for as well. So uh, I'm assuming we can do that, but possibly is this, yeah. Would this be something that we no, it wouldn't. Your goals, I guess, would be public like any anything else. Is that correct? Kathleen? Taylor can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, the goals themselves would be public. The evaluation of an employee yeah. could be private, but if you do a I, I don't know on the evaluation piece of when that that information, yeah. if you did a formal evaluation, it, when that becomes public or if that's an executive session. Okay. <clears throat> but that will be something that we want to uh, discuss uh, or that we want to hear from our county manager in, uh, in due time too, as well, <clears throat> expeditiously, as we are going to look at these other policy goals, this would be, uh, you know, on the heels of it as well. 
same kind of setup since we've well, we had a pretty big agenda today we're going to put these other two things off for another time so we're fresh <laughs> all right <laughs> if, if is there anything else for the good of the order okay if not thank you very much have a good rest of the day